Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am pleased to call to order the 266th, 266th meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council in Seattle, Washington, and conducted by webinar. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during this meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and to provide the council with comments on issues before the council at this meeting. Please note that the webinar chat feature should be used for technical issues only and not to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on the April Council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed for the person that is in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. But depending upon the number of uh, folks who have signed up for public comment, that time may get reduced. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please submit them in electronic format to the electronic portal when you sign up for testimony. Written comments must re relate directly to your oral testimony to be accepted at this stage. After you speak to the agenda item, the comments will be posted and made part of the official record of this meeting. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recordings will be available from the council website, or you may purchase audio recording copies from the meeting recorder, Mr. Craig Hess. Let me remind council members and others to speak directly into your microphones so that all can hear. Lastly, I ask that all council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on their cell phones and mute your connection while the council meeting is in session. I have uh, some introductions here. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Cross from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a new designee. And um, I would like now like to ask our executive director, Mr. Merrick Burden, to call the role of council members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will call the roll. Um, Heather Hall. Here. Phil Anderson. Here. Danny Evenson. Present. Michael Clark. Here. Robert Dooley. Here. Lieutenant Leela Lingo. Present. Mark Gorelnik. Here. Dave Hansen. Dave is absent today. Pete Hessemer. Present. David Hogan. I believe David is absent today. Um, Chris Kern. Here. Virgil Moore. Here. Joe Oatman. Here. Brad Pettinger. Here. Corey Writings. Here. Butch Smith. Here. Krista Svensson. Present. Ryan Wolf. Here. Marcy Uremko. Here. That concludes the roll, Mr. Chairman. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get started on our ambitious agenda for this meeting, we need to have an approved agenda. So at this point in time, I'll ask if there are any proposed changes to the agenda or I'll welcome a motion to approve the agenda. <clears throat> I 
Heather. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, I move that the council uh, approve the council meeting agenda as a as printed in agenda item A4, April 2022. Thank you, Heather, for the motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Bob Dooley. Uh, any discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Heather, thank you very much for the motion. We have an agenda. So without further ado, we'll get started on our agenda. And I'll turn to our Executive Director, Merrick Burden, for the ED report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, everyone, both here in person and online. A um, couple issues um, to note uh, as part of my ED report. First is we are continuing to uh, master this hybrid uh, version of a council meeting that we are embarking on today. So. Thank you all for your patience as we uh, continue down this road. Um, I believe we've worked out some of the, the issues that were plaguing the SAS last meeting. Um, but if there are issues, please let me or one of my staff know and we will do our best to accommodate whatever troubles uh, you may be experiencing. Uh, second, we do have a, a different setup here um, than you may be accustomed to in person, um, starting first with our microphones. Uh, please be sure to press the button when you need to speak and press it again when you're done. That's a little bit different from what many of us uh, have, have grown accustomed to, uh, but it works quite well, especially if we've been uh, like me and you've been using Zoom for the last two years and are used to muting and unmuting. It's kind of the same thing. Um, with that, I would uh, like to make note of a few things. Um, for those of us here and those of us listening, we have several alternates. Um, that are in place on our advisory bodies as part of this meeting. So on the SDT, we have uh, Kyle Vandegraaff filling the seat for WDFW and Stephanie Thurner um, replacing or sitting in for Ashton Harp on the tribal seat. On the CPSAS, we have an alternate, Mike Thompson in place of Steve Crook. The model evaluation work group, Emily Shallow is sitting in on the ODFW seat. On the ground fish advisory panel, we have a couple of alternates. Brent Payne is sitting in for Ruth Christensen and Lynn Walton is sitting in for Bob Alverson. And on the salmon advisory sub panel, we have Mark Newell in place of Darius Peak and Chris Sowen in place of Michael Sowen. A couple of other items to make note for you. Um, one is um, over the last few weeks, we've been working on the council member ongoing development, um, which would be building up to what I believe is our first meeting of this, um, this entity, for lack of a better word. We are aiming for a November meeting uh, of the CMOD. Um, the topic to be discussed, there are a couple. Uh, one is um, more along the lines of uh, helping to shape motions and uh, engaging as a council member the other uh, more substantive topic as part of the CMOD uh, agenda is the topic of ecosystem-based fishery management. Um, so over the coming weeks, uh, the chair and I will be putting our heads together on um, how best to um, solicit some of you all on the council for uh, participation in that. What we're aiming for is two or three council members to participate in uh, the CMOD meeting this year. Um, so stay tuned for, for uh, more on that. The other thing to make you aware of is that uh, several executive directors, uh, myself included, and NOAA have been working together over the last couple of months on what I'll coin uh, model um, harassment policies. Um, NOAA came to the CCC uh, several months ago, I think even before my tenure, um, outlining their desire to help the councils um, in crafting and implementing policies concerning uh, harassment of many different kinds. Uh, so these uh, model harassment policies are under development. Um, there's still some ways to go. The idea is that these uh, will become available as a template or an example that we may be able to use for our own purposes at some point in the future. The actual timing of that uh, isn't clear to me just yet, but um, just want to make you aware that that is coming and we can use them um, as we see fit when they are, are ready. So uh, that would conclude my executive director's report, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. It really should be the model anti-harassment or uh, 
yeah. policies. Um, are there any any questions uh, or comments on the ED report? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Merrick, for that report. Uh, could you just expand a little bit on the C mod? What I, I think I heard you say the C mod sessions. What could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, so where we are at now is uh, trying to formulate our agenda for the uh, upcoming CMOD uh, meeting. Um, and we have, if I recall correctly, we have uh, two days scheduled. Um, those two days would encompass two major topics. So the largest topic is the topic of ecosystem-based fishery management. And the, the question <clears throat> the question around that essentially is how are different councils interpreting that and what are we all doing to uh, implement um, different types of EBFM. As, and as I'm sure you're aware, each council has a slightly different take on it. And so we hope to learn from each other and um, just hear what others are doing as we try to embark on this um, this topic that a lot of folks are still struggling to, to implement and figure out what it means. Um, there won't be anything prescriptive coming out of that. It's more of a, an information sharing and um, information sharing exercise with one another. The other major topic is more uh, along the lines of what we might think of as um, council member uh, development uh, in terms of process. So um, one of the things that uh, Mr. Dooley and I have spent some time talking about, Mr. Dooley is also on the steering committee. Um, he and I have been talking about is uh, the need to um, help council members um, um, through the process of making sound emotions, for instance, and how, how to embark on a, uh, how, how to engage in the council in a way that makes you an effective council member. Um, so structuring motions, building momentum for motions, um, and speaking with one another about how, how to best go about that and the lessons that we've all learned from that, um, that, uh, that, that really important role. So um, does that answer your question, Mr. Anderson? Yeah, thank you. Any further questions or comment on the executive director's report? All right, thank you very much, Merrick. So uh, next uh, on our agenda is our open public comment. And uh, last I looked, we did not have any signups for that and I'll check again. We did have one written comment submitted, which is in, in our briefing book with regard to Southern resident killer whales, but uh, I don't see any signups. So that will conclude um, very quickly uh, agenda item B uh, for open comment B1. So uh, we'll now go uh, very quickly to habitat issues and our staff officer, Carrie, you want to uh, get, get us started there. Carrie Griffin. We may be moving a bit quick for Carrie. So let's just pause for a moment here and give him a chance to connect. I see him online, but he's muted. Hello, Mike check here. You, we hear you loud and clear, welcome. Okay, thank you, I'm so sorry. I've been uh, bouncing between meetings and uh, just saw the note that we uh, jumped to Habitat. So uh, here I am. Um, this is Carrie Griffin. I'll read the situation summary for agenda item C1, Habitat Issues. The Habitat Committee uh, met on Thursday and is meeting now also. Um, Friday, April 7th and 8th, 2022, 
to discuss the Klamath Dam removal, uh, the groundfish non-trawl rockfish conservation area, um, and Central Valley Chinook, among other items. Um, we also received a briefing from NOAA's Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program um, uh, yesterday. Um, these items are summarized in a supplemental Habitat Committee report, which is posted and in briefing book materials. Uh, and there's a couple of um, um, elements of particular interest for the council that Corey Green will cover in just a moment when he um, reads that report. Um, uh, also in your briefing book materials is a draft letter on Klamath Dam removal. Um, the, the letter references four attachments, which are previous letters that the council has uh, sent dating all the way back to 2006. And links to those letters are included in the Habitat Committee's reports. Some of those, I just want to clarify, some of those are they're linked to um, previous briefing books. And so at least one or two of those are draft letters. But when we, uh, assuming the council approves the letter to send to the Bureau of Reclamation, um, the, the final, you know, official signed letters would be attached to that, even though those links uh, link in some cases to drafts. Um, there's also two public comments that are in the public comment portal. Those are also referenced um, in the Habitat Committee's report, which you'll hear about. Uh, so after I finish, then we'll turn to Corey Green uh, to read the Habitat Committee report, and then reports and comments of management entities, advisory bodies, uh, followed by public comment, and then council action, which is to consider the Habitat Committee report and any recommendations. So that concludes my overview, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. Any questions from Carrie on uh, any questions to Carrie on the overview? And not seeing any hands, we'll go directly to the Habitat Committee, uh, Corey Green. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Can can you hear me? You bet. All right, I'm reading Agenda Item C One A, the Supplemental Habitat Committee Report One. And so the first two items that I have here are um, for potential council action. So the first is the Morro Bay Wind Energy Area, the draft environmental impact, sorry, pardon me, the draft environmental assessment for the Morro Bay Wind Energy Area was just released for public comment by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. The deadline for comments is May 6th. The council previously authorized a letter from the Morro Bay call area and the Habitat Committee intends to work with the Marine Planning Committee to prepare a quick response letter modeled, modeled generally after the Humboldt WEA letter. The second item is uh, the Klamath Dam Removal Environmental Impact Statement. The HC produced a comment letter on the Klamath Dam Removal Environmental Impact Statement for Council consideration agenda item C1, supplemental attachment one, as directed by the council at its March 22 meeting. The letter is ready for council review and submittal by the April 18th comment deadline. The HC notes that there are four attachments referenced in the letter. These are all prior council letters related to the Klamath Dam removal and they are, uh, links are reported here. Next item is uh, we heard a report from the stat on the status of Sacramento River Chinook salmon. We heard a presentation from Steve Morano, National Marine Fisheries Service, California Central Valley Office, on the status of Central Valley Chinook salmon. California remains in a third year of hot and dry drought conditions with only two large storage systems in the 21-22 water year. Shasta Reservoir is currently at about 50% capacity. And as of April 1st, 2022, the snowpack in California is at 39% of average, which will limit surface water runoff and will restrain stream temperature management. All four Chinook salmon runs are highly susceptible to climate change and drought conditions. Despite decent returns in the ocean last year, there continues to be poor juvenile productivity, preventing us, the stock from capitalizing on good ocean conditions. 
loss of access for Sea of Chinook to high elevation streams has resulted in both loss of spatial and temporal diversity. Historically, winter run, Chinook had access to 190 miles of stream for rearing habitat and are now constrained to roughly five miles. This makes stocks particularly vulnerable to drought conditions and other events such as fire, oil spills, and a closely located Superfund site. Management of in-stream temperature during drought conditions is difficult. NIMPS has identified 53.5 degrees Fahrenheit as the ideal maximum temperature for in-stream management and is currently advocating for this change. The, for multiple years, 56 degrees Fahrenheit has been the temperature identified as the maximum temperature management standard. Due to low reservoir levels in 2021, the 56 degree threshold was exceeded on several occasions. The Department of Water Resources has developed a drought toolkit that includes options such as water transfers, water releases, and trucking, all of which have had various levels of success. Starting February of 2022, the Bureau of Reclamation will reestablish habitat as a priority in its management of management operations. Multiple habitat-related emerging issues are on the horizon that may affect Central Valley Chinook and will be consulted on by NIMPS simultaneously. The HC may consider these issues on their June agenda. These th the three issues are the combined essential fish habitat effects of the Delta Conveyance Plan, the site's reservoir, and the reinitiation of consultation on the long-term operation of the Central Valley Project State Water Project. The Delta Conveyance, formerly the Cal Water Fix, is a proposed water bypass project underneath the Sacramento Delta. Probable effects of the action include temporary construction effects, bank armoring, changes in flow, and potential fish screen interactions. Sites Reservoir is an off-stream storage project off the Sacramento River that would result in changes to flow and water quality and fish screen interactions. CV SWP operations could impact Pacific salmon EFH for spawning, rearing, and migration, resulting from stressors related to water quality, water temperatures, habitat entrainment, and increased predation. The HC will continue to follow the processes going on in the Central Valley that may impact Central Valley Chinook and habitat and will identify opportunities for the Council to engage and comment. The HC recommends that the Council consider supporting the 53.5 degree Fahrenheit threshold identified by NIMS and submitting comments in support to the CV SWP when a comment period is identified. Next issue uh, is National Oceanic and Atmospheric Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program. The Habitat Committee heard a presentation on the Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program, focused on deep sea coral and sponge exploration in the U.S. West Coast for 2018 to 2021. The DSCRTP and their associated West Coast researchers have a history of presenting periodic briefings to the HC on their ongoing research efforts and discoveries. The presentation was provided by Tom Leidig, the Southwest Fishery Science Center, Elizabeth Clark of the Northwest Center, Chris Caldo of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, Abigail Powell at Northwest Fishery Science Center, and Heather Coleman of the uh, Deep Sea Coral Program. The team described their 2018 and 19 Expanding Pacific Research and Exploration of Submerged Systems, or EXPRESS, research program that compared habitat types and fish, deep sea coral, and sponge densities in areas that were designated to be reopened to bottom trawling in 2020. One unique observation during the express effort was the discovery of an extensive and diverse deep sea coral garden on the Mendocino Ridge EFH conservation area in about 400 meters water depth. The, a coral garden is defined by a specific high density of corals and the Mendocino garden had an order of magnitude higher density than that threshold. This portion of the presentation highlighted the application of environmental DNA techniques to augment visual surveys. The next section of the presentation focused on areas being considered for wind energy development, summarizing and comparing historical and new observations of habitat and fish, and deep sea coral and sponge densities from autonomous underwater vehicles and remotely operated vehicle dives. The highlight of this research effort was the discovery of another coral garden in 
deep water off Morro Bay in a petroleum salt spawning area in Santa Lucia Bank. The presenters described a new discovery of potential glass sponge reef in the vicinity of Anacapa Island in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Previously, glass sponge reefs have only been observed in the eastern North Pacific and British Columbia and Alaska. The discovery was in an area of soft bottom at a water depth of about 500 meters. In addition to the discovery in the Channel Islands, the team discussed a 35-year time series of ob observations of glass sponges in the Catalina Basin. Over that time period, the sponges showed massive deterioration and collapse. The next uh, issue is the Nahalem Bank uh, Central Fish Habitat Conservation Area Long-Term Monitoring Study. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife initiated a long-term study of seafloor habitats associated with the trimp trawl fishery in the vicinity of Nahalem Bank in 2007. ROV video transects were conducted inside and outside the boundary of the Nahalem Bank EFHCA, focusing primarily on the abundance and height of invertebrates, such as sea whips and sea pens, found in the soft sediments east of the rocky bank. Further sampling was conducted in 2013, providing a before-after control impact comparison for examining change in invertebrate abundance between the protected EFHCA and the areas open to shrimp trawling. Another sampling iteration is planned for spring 2022 with the goal of returning to the same sampled areas and extending the time series to examine how seafloor habitats may have been affected by 16 years of trawling exclusion. The agency will provide a summary of this year's observation in a future Habitat Committee report. The next item on the agenda was the Potter Valley Project on the Eel River. The Eel Re River used to be California's third largest salmon producing system. It currently has a state and federally listed Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead. The Eel River has two dams with no fish passage and with license expiring this year. No new entity has come forward to relicense the project, so it will likely go to license surrender and decommissioning. It is unclear what will happen in the interim before decommissioning, but since the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission can extend the license for on a yearly basis, NIMPS has weighed in and asked for conditions to be added during this extension period to prevent jeopardy to ESA-listed fish. The project is now enmeshed in the massive Pacific Gas and Electric bankruptcy proceeding, and its fate is uncertain. Depending on how FERC deals with this orphan project, the Council may want to comment in support of project dam removals in the near future. The final item is uh, deals with the Rogue River Basin and a couple pu public comment letters. There are two public comment letters in the briefing book that highlight habitat issues related to Southern Oregon and Northern California Coast Coho in the Rogue Basin. One relates to the importance of releasing cooler water from the bottom of dams to benefit salmon survival. The other relates to the diversion of Rogue Basin water for illegal cannabis grow operations. This has been elevated as an official complaint to the NOAA Law Office of Law Enforcement. So, uh, going back to the recommendations for council action, HC recommends that the council submit the Klamath Dam removal letter by April 18th, 2022, and submit a Morro Bay Wind Energy Area Quick Response Letter by May 6, 2022, consistent with council guidance from its March 2022 meeting. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Corey. Are there questions for Corey on the Habitat Committee report? Marcy Remco. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Corey. Good morning. Um, I will work through um, a number of questions I have on the report, and I guess I'll just go in order, um, and maybe I'll start with the comment letter on the Klamath Dam removal EIS. Um, my question is about the section describing sunk coho fisheries on page three, paragraph two, the, the second full paragraph on page three. Okay, hold on, let me 
find it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the second sentence in this paragraph states that all sunk coho fisheries have been closed and their retention illegal in California since the mid 1990s. And I'm wondering if the HC discussed or considered uh, the tribal fisheries in California. Um, I'm just wondering if it might be more appropriate to include an edit to state that we mean all non-tribal sunk coho fisheries have been closed and their retention illegal. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I think that would be a good edit. Okay, thank you. Um, moving to, back to your HC report. Um, on the discussion of in-stream temperature during drought conditions um, in the Sacramento River or Central Valley Basin. Um, the report indicates that NIMS has identified 53.5 degrees as the ideal maximum for in-stream management uh, and is pressing for a change from 56 degrees. Um, I guess I'm hoping for a little more context or, or discussion about what that means, um, because it sounds like the HC is recommending the council support uh, the lower uh, temperature threshold identified by NIMS and that we state that in upcoming comment letters. Um, so is this like a standard that applies to the entire Central Valley Basin? Is it um, is that an appropriate threshold for everywhere in the basin? Are there, um, you know, I'm, I'm just interested in knowing a little more about um, the NIMS recommendation and why the council needs to uh, support this recommendation here and now. Yeah, that's a, a good point for clarification. This... Um, Threshold is really important from the perspective of understanding um, uh, mortality to uh, egg nests of winter run stock, uh, primarily uh, below Shasta Dam. Um, and so that's where this threshold has become really important. And the difference between sort of the 53.5 and the 56 is a sort of a, a, a difference reflecting sort of on the ground conditions of 53.5 versus sort of a theoretical uh, um, level of 56. And, and so what NIMS has, has found is that um, when you sort of apply these um, theoretical aspects to natural conditions, uh, a more conservative estimate of temperature is warranted for the threshold. If I may, thank you. Um, just a follow-up. Um, what is the, I'm, I'm still, I think, having a little bit of difficulty understanding the need for a council endorsement of this threshold right now when we haven't yet been, um, we haven't yet tasked you with drafting a comment letter on these topics quite yet. Yeah, I think when we suggested uh, sort of your support for this, it, it is more for sort of future uh, responses, particularly as some of these um, Emerging issues from uh, multiple multiple sort of re reviews are come are come on board, and so yeah, you're right in that. There's nothing specific about a recommendation that could that would sort of apply for this meeting. It's it's very much sort of geared toward sort of future um, future comment periods. Okay. Thank you. Um, one more 
moving to the Potter Valley project section. Mm -hmm. um, you've indicated that NIMS has weighed in on the, um, I guess this is in the, on the license extension to ask for conditions to be added to prevent jeopardy to ESA listed fish. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us what those conditions are and if there's any discussion about the content that we um, just received in our in an upcoming salmon agenda item on the reinitiation of consultation uh, for California coastal Chinook, um, if that's at all um, part of the consideration here with NIMS's conditions. I'm, I'm actually not quite sure of those conditions. And, and so if, if Susan Bishop is, is uh, listening in, maybe that would be a better question for Susan Bishop than myself. Anything else, Marcy? No, thank you. Any further questions on the Habitat Committee report? Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you. Well, that's the only report, and I don't believe we have any public comment. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Bob Dooley. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I didn't have, guess I didn't have my hand up fast enough, but um, I had one question for Corey, if that's okay. If of course. There. Um, on your page one, actually, of your report, the status of the Sacramento River Chinook salmon, uh, the fourth sentence, it says Shasta Reservoir is currently at about 50% capacity. And I note that it's really at 38% capacity today, but it's 50%, nearly 50% of average. So are you saying it's 50% of average capacity? And that might be something worth noting for clarification, just to, for future reference that we're uh, looking at average capacity rather than total capacity. It's just question kind of that, does that matter? Um, this was a report from uh, NIMFs on this, and I can, I can check on whether it should be average um, or total. Uh, I, I can't quite remember um, which it is, but I, I can check on that. And if it's average capacity, then that probably should be inserted for clarification. All right, anything further? Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just wondering if National Marine Fishery Service might be able to follow up and respond um, to the question regarding the conditions that NIMS has requested um, regarding this extension period on the Potter Valley project. If you have any additional detail, it might be of interest to the council. Thank you. Yeah, the chair. Thank you much for the question. I do not have the details on the specific conditions that were requested by um, one of our other uh, divisions in regards to that um, potential FERC extension, but I can look into it and get back to the council. Thank you, Ryan. Any further questions of Corey on the Habitat Committee report? All right, Corey, once again, thank you. Thank you. And I, I should say that I'm also going to ask about that and we'll try to get back to you. Great. All right. Um, I don't think we have any public uh, comment. Um, so that will take us to council discussion and action on the Habitat Committee report. Uh, we have a draft letter before us and there is also a recommendation for a quick response letter. So uh, let's see what the what sort of discussion we have uh, here at the council. Marcy? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess maybe we might start with the uh, 
draft letter available to us uh, in agenda item C1 supplemental attachment one uh, to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, I would support sending the draft letter uh, as shown in the attachment with the edit that was discussed uh, with Mr. Green in discussion. And that would just be the simple addition of uh, the word non-tribal uh, on page three in the second full paragraph, second sentence regarding the sunk coho fisheries in California. All right, thank you, Marcy. Yeah, I think yeah, let's take these one at a time. So is there any other input on that letter? I'm seeing a thumb, one thumb up and not any hands to, to offer any further changes to the letter. Um, is there any objection to sending this letter? I don't know that we need a motion here, but I just wanna make sure everyone is comfortable with that letter and we can send that out before the deadline. I'm seeing nods around the table, so that letter is, is good to go. Thank you. So let's carry on uh, here. There is a, uh, another topic of the committee report was the Mora Bay Wind Energy area with a deadline for public comments is May 6th. We do not have a draft letter before us on that. So if we're gonna do a letter, um, then it will have to be via quick response. So I wanna see if there's a sense of the council here to instruct uh, our bodies here, which I guess would be the Marine Planning Committee and the Habitat Committee to um, move forward and present a letter uh, for a quick response approval. So let's see what sort of discussion, if any, we have on that. Uh, is there any objection with moving forward as recommended by the Habitat Committee? We'll start there. And I'm not seeing any, any objections. Oh. oh, Kerry, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just real quick, I wanted to remind the council that you actually um, gave the green light for this letter at the last meeting, knowing that this um, that this notice was uh, pending. And so the council has already given direction for staff to work with the um, advisory bodies to develop a QR letter on this. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to reiterate that, but I just wanted to remind everyone that um, you knew this was coming and you did um, anticipate it and, and green light moving forward with a QR letter on it. All right, thanks for that, Carrie. I just wanna make sure council didn't change its mind. So we'll move forward with that. And um, those bodies will work with staff uh, to get a letter prepared and circulated for comment and approval. Those were the two recommendations from the Habitat Committee. There are a number of other issues raised. Um, in, in this helpful report. Let's see if there's any further discussion. Marcy Remco. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, or Mr. Chair, apologies. Um, <laughs> on the topic of the recommendation from the HC to consider the reduced uh, temperature threshold for the Central Valley, I, I think um, I appreciate that recommendation. I appreciate NIMS bringing that to the discussion uh, in the HC room. Uh, I think generally we we can support that kind of a recommendation, but I would say that maybe it's not um, necessary at this time for us to make that as a, a standing recommendation that's going to be appropriate in all of our future comment letters on the topic of Central Valley water. So um, I know that back stateside there's some homework to do about um, different state agencies that have different opinions on this particular issue and I think there are circumstances that you know might apply um, in different parts of the Central Valley um, that would warrant special consideration um, so I, I appreciate the discussion um, I think the thinking is on the right track but 
I would maybe stop short of making a blanket recommendation at this particular time. Thank you, Marcy. I just got a thinking back a few years ago, we had, um, well, we've had chronic temperature control problems. Um, the temperature control device um, on the Sacramento River is, it seems to have had uh, a number of technical challenges, which has resulted in extraordinary mortality of eggs and juveniles. And I do recall a statement, I don't recall whether it was from the Bureau of Reclamation or the Department of Water Resources. Uh, they had interpreted the threshold of 56 degrees to include anything up to and including 56.9 degrees. They just simply truncated rather than rounded. So I, I think that uh, while I think the focus tends to be on the winter Chinook because it's listed, um, our council managed fisheries rely more so on the fall Chinook, uh, which um, have, um, have been hammered as hard, uh, even harder because <laughs> they have tended to drop the water level once the winter Chinook emerge there are in stranding reds of, um, of the fall Chinook. So, but I agree with you, Marcy, this is, this is something we, we could support. I'm not just sure we have a mechanism right now uh, to do that. And it certainly would be too late for this year in any event, because it's already April. And so, um, is there any further discussion or action of Marcy? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we leave uh, the discussion, um, I just want to thank the HC for its work crafting um, the letter that we have just approved sending uh, to FERC um, on the Klamath Dam removal. And I appreciate the discussion that the HC had uh, relating to the Potter Valley project um, and giving us kind of an early heads up that we may wish to comment in support of uh, dam removal uh, um, in the future. Um, I think uh, that's certainly something that I would support putting on the, the to-do list in the future. And um, I just appreciate um, folks that are in the know bringing this content to us uh, in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Anything further from the council? Mr. Griffin, how are we doing on this agenda item? Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Marcy and Bob. And for the comments, uh, uh, you have concluded your business for this, for this agenda item. Uh, I'll make that minor uh, edit to the Klamath Dam removal letter that is to FERC. I think I said Bureau of Rec earlier. Uh, it is actually to FERC. Um, and we'll get that sent off and I'll initiate um, a QR letter on the Morro Bay Wind Energy Area draft EA and get that moving forward. Um, and Marcy, thanks for the kind words about the uh, Habitat Committee. Um, Glenn Spain um, did the lion's share of the work on drafting that letter and uh, he did a really good job. And uh, got lots of input from the Habitat Committee members. And um, so I'll make sure to pass on those kudos to Glenn and the rest of the Habitat Committee. But um, with that, I think that it, it, uh, concludes your work on this agenda item. All right. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you, Habitat Committee. Thank you, Council. Uh, that concludes Habitat Issues. Mm -hmm. And um, we have before us, uh, for the remainder of the day, Salmon, um, and uh, our Vice Chair Brad Pettinger has the gavel uh, for salmon, but um, while we haven't been at this very long, there's no reason not to take a break here. Um, so why don't we come back at 10.05, I'll hand the gavel to Brad, and um, we'll get started on salmon. 10.05.
All right, welcome back to day one of our April meeting. Um, I'll note that uh, if if we were in the uh, central time zone or in the eastern time zone, we would still be on time. We're running that much ahead of schedule here. Um, but we here we are at 10.05, we're, we're going to get started on salmon. And as promised or threatened, I'm going to turn the gavel over to our vice chair, Brad Pettinger. Uh, thank you, Jared Rolick, and uh, welcome everyone this, this morning. And with that, I'll turn to uh, Robin to kick us off on uh, D1. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this is agenda item D1, the National Marine Fisheries Service report for salmon. Uh, NIMPS will uh, provide, well, NIMPS and the uh, Fishery Science Centers will give us a report on any recent developments relative to salmon fisheries and issues of interest to the council. We'll start with uh, Susan Bishop. She'll give a regulatory report and we'll follow that with a report from the Science Center's uh, a PowerPoint presentation. And I think Corey Green will be giving that. But that is uh, my summary then of what you can expect under D1. Thank you, Robin. Uh, questions for Robin on her overview? Okay, seeing that, we'll go to Susan Bishop. Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Members of the council, um, I will be um, speaking to agenda item D1A, Supplemental NIMS Report, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service Regulatory Activities, and I'll be um, uh, speaking to a couple of follow-up items from the March meeting. Um, in March, we indicated that we were completing our um, adequate progress review on the four uh, salmon stocks that are currently under rebuilding plans. That is a requirement of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Uh, specifically section 304E7 of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act and regulations at 50 CFR 600-310-J34 require that NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service to periodically review the rebuilding progress of stocks being managed under rebuilding plans. NIMS West Coast Region recently reviewed the rebuilding progress for four stocks of Pacific Coast salmon being managed under rebuilding plans approved by NIMS in 2020 and 2021. Those are Klamath River Fall Run Chinook Salmon, Snohomish River Natural Coho Salmon, Strait of Juan de Fuca Natural Coho, and the Queets River Natural Coho Salmon. Recall, recall that Sacramento uh, Fall Chinook had been under a rebuilding plan, but are, have subsequently been rebuilt, considered rebuilt. Um, there are criteria in the national standard NS1 guidelines state that the secretary may find that a stock is not making adequate rebuilding progress if either the total fishing mortality rate required to rebuild the stock within the rebuilding time frame or the annual catch limit associated with that is exceeded and accountability measures are not correcting the operational issue that caused the overage nor addressing any biological consequences to the stock or stock complex resulting from the overage when it is known. Uh, we should note that under the salmon FMP, ACLs and other status determination uh, criteria for salmon are based on spawning escapement, not catch. And we use the term uh, SACL. Um, the second criteria that we evaluate when making a, a determination of uh, progress is the rebuilding expectations of a stock or a stock complex are significantly changed due to new and unexpected information about the status of the stock. Um, I won't go into the details. The report provides the details behind our findings for each of the four uh, uh, salmon stocks under rebuilding plans. Um, sort of the bottom line is that the West Coast region is not recommending a determination of inadequate progress for any of these stocks as a result of its review and does not propose recommending additional management measures to the council. Um, our findings were based on a variety of factors um, for all four stocks. Uh, overall, poor productivity due to freshwater and marine conditions um, was the proximate cause of the decline. Uh, and there's no change in that situation um, that would meet the second criteria. Uh, with regard to the first criteria, uh, Klamath um, Fall Chinook uh, uh, have, have uh, not exceeded their FMSY or their ACL or its ACL um, uh, and has made some progress uh, in terms of higher escapements in uh, recent years. 
uh, for the three fall uh, for the three uh, coho stocks. They're uh, managed under international exceptions um, as they are managed under provisions of the uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty. And in that case, uh, the first uh, criteria outlined in our report does not apply. Um, for those stocks, uh, there was a combination of other factors that led to our conclusion. Those stocks all have very low impacts in council fisheries. We have seen improvements in escapement in recent years for several of them. In fact, um, Snohomish uh, coho have improved from an overfished condition to a not overfished rebuilding condition. Um, so for further details, I refer you to our um, the uh, NIMS report. Are there any questions? Questions for Susan? Seeing none. The second item in, in my report uh, has to do with a reinitiation of ESA consultation on California coastal Chinook. A reinitiation of consultation under the Endangered Species Act is required where discretionary federal agency involvement or control over the action has been retained or is authorized by law. And most relevant to this circumstance, if the amount or extent of taking specified in the incidental take statement is exceeded. Um, second, if new information reveals effects of the agency action that may affect listed species or critical habitat in a manner or to an extent not previously considered, or three, if the identified action is subsequently modified in a manner that causes an effect to the listed species or critical habitat that was not considered in the biological opinion or written concurrence, or if a new listed or if a new species is listed or critical habitat designated that may be affected by the identified action. In its 2022 guidance letter, um, NIMS provided an overview of the recent performance of the Council's ocean salmon fisheries and their impact to California coastal Chinook relative to the take limit under the Endangered Species Act. Based on the information evaluated to date, as described in our supplemental report to the Council in March, NIMS expects that the actions and modeling adjustments taken this year in combination with those taken in 2021 will limit ocean impacts to California coastal Chinook to not exceed the current consultation limit of a 16% age 4 harvest rate on Klamath River Falls Chinook salmon. However, the ESA requires reinitiation of consultation where take limits are exceeded. And we wanted to take this opportunity to notify the council that we have reinitiated consultation on the effects of the fisheries managed by the NIMS and the council under the salmon FMP on California coastal Chinook uh, evolutionarily significant unit. Um, the FMP does include a management objective for California coastal Chinook. Um, we anticipate completion of a biological opinion prior to the implementation of the regulations for the 2023 ocean salmon season. Given the available information, we do not see the reinitiation affecting the 2022 ocean salmon season, but it is possible that new information may arise in the course of completing our consultation that may refine our thinking. Should that occur, we, can, we will make every effort to provide that information to the council as quickly as possible. So that um, last um, piece of information was, was just noting that we can't be pre-decisional in our finding. Our intent is to be as transparent and open and communicative to the council as, um, um, as desired. Um, at this point, um, we are not contemplating our, the action that we would be consulting on or reinitiating consultation on is the control rule that is in the FMP um, and the implementation of the FMP under that. Um, and I'd take questions. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Questions for Susan? <laughs> I, I think you're off the hook. Oh, Marcy, you're up. Go, Marcy. Not, not a question so much, but just wanted to thank Susan for her work to keep us informed um, and bringing us this information uh, as early as possible. And the heads up, basically, that we got back in March that this might, might be coming. And... Um, We've had the opportunity for a lot of offline dialogue on this topic uh, since March and just want to thank Susan for her willingness to uh, engage and, and discuss as much as there is to discuss at this point in time. So just appreciate the coordination. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks, Susan. And with that, that'll take us to the uh, 
Science Center Activities Report, and I believe uh, Corey Green. Corey? Thank you, Vice Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a presentation of some recent Science Center activities uh, regarding this question about climate responses and salmon. At the March meeting, there was a lot of discussion about the importance of moving toward climate resilient fisheries management. And the ecosystem status report now provides a wealth of climate sensitive indicators. Likewise, recent extreme events such as the marine heat waves shown on the left side for 2015 and the low snowpack in recent years, including this last one shown in the middle, provide a window into the conditions we might expect as climate impacts progress. Salmon might be viewed as a priority species to incorporate climate-based information in fisheries management due to their relatively short life cycles and good monitoring. At the same time, efforts to improve forecasts of salmon with climate information have often failed to maintain their performance year after year. And so today I'd like to highlight some of the recent research by Science Center shedding light on the complexity of this question. Next slide. So a sort of short, really short answer to this question I posed in the title is really that context matters. Um, and I'm going to give you several sort of examples from Science Center publications uh, in, in the context of spatial and temperature variation, basically when and where fish are and how that overlaps with environmental conditions. Life history variation, basically these evolved uh, strategies that salmon use to mitigate climate impacts. And then species differences as well. And I hope those give you a, a good perspective on some of the complexities we face when we're thinking about incorporating climate um, into sort of our fisheries management models for salmon. So the first example I'm going to give focused on the spatial and temporal variation. Next slide. Is work that's been headed by Oli Shelton of the Science and Statistical Committee. And basically, this is a huge effort to incorporate recoveries of coded wire tags across the Pacific Ocean. And so this graphic here shows the distribution of those tags. And so uh, what we have here is uh, various stocks represented by the different colors and their or, uh, origin location shown as triangles on uh, the gray portion of the map. And uh, their ocean distribution is represented as different categories shown on the left side of the map, ranging from Monterey Bay at the bottom to Southeast Alaska, Northeast Alaska on the top. And the size of those uh, circles represents the stock specific proportional ocean distribution for that subregion. And so you can see a huge, lot of, a huge amount of variation that's uh, stock specific and uh, region specific. And so a couple of examples just focused on the red, which is Northern California. Those show a fairly sort of even distribution across the three states coastal areas, um, and, but and heading up as far as sort of the, the Washington coast. Uh, in contrast, a stock such as um, the Washington coast stock, which is a, a dark orange there, um, as uh, can be seen uh, in high numbers as far north as Alaska. And so taking this information, they looked at uh, potential effects of climate by overlaying this information with sea surface temperature values for those different areas. Next slide. So an important uh, finding was that uh, different stocks um, had not one, but sort of several potential thermal niches and showed extensive annual variation. And so on the Basically, this weighted mean temperature axis assigns the sort of abundance of these coded wire tag recoveries and weights and weights the um, temperature records we have for different regions. The far right there is sort of the equal standard, basically applying um, 
sea surface temperature using equal weights for all the 17 ocean regions. Whereas for stock specific ones, these sh um, shown for um, say uh, California Central Valley Fall Run on the far left um, or Upper River uh, brights shown next to the equal one. Those are uh, based on sort of weighting those temperature values by the relative abundance of these recoveries. And so what you can see here is that there's no simple thermal niche for the entire species. Um, using a single thermal niche would provide incorrect projections, particularly for species or for stocks like the Upper River brights or for the Middle Columbia River stocks. We can use this information further to project uh, to see what, uh, how abundance will change with changing temperatures in the ocean. Next slide. And so what they did was they used projections of, over te of ocean temperature and then simulated six focal populations based on their observed abundances and uh, tracked how the abundance would change over time. And so what you can see here is the predicted abundance on the y-axis. And uh, on the x-axis are basically these different uh, regions where um, these stocks would be captured. And uh, so if you look on the right side, I mean, on the left side, you can see that this sort of, there's, there's some changes uh, which seem fairly moderate, but certain, air, certain regions uh, change substantially so in some respects to the order of 20 to 40%. And that's highlighted on the right side, showing uh, the relative change uh, for ocean distributions. And places like Alaska and British Columbia don't change uh, too much in, this, in terms of this, the uh, abundance in those capture regions. But uh, Northern California and Central California change immensely, really resulting from shifts in, this, in the stocks um, in those areas. So that's uh, um, sort of thinking about climate change projections at a very large scale. And um, now I'm going to go sort of, sort of spatial context at a very small scale. Next slide. And sort of thinking about what fish are doing within river as they're migrating downstream and uh, impact, getting impacted by say non uh, indigenous species such as um, striped and smallmouth bass and largemouth bass. And this is a case for the uh, lower Sacramento river where these uh, species have really sort of constrained survival for migrating salmon. And the idea shown in the left panel uh, with those uh, pictures of, of, of predators and their habitats are that when you have one predator such as striped bass, sort of uh, salmon might be able to mitigate mortality by sort of using littoral areas um, to hide from those pelagic or those uh, water column predators. But when you have when you have sort of a double uh, whammy of these of multiple predators, you get into a situation where um, the the predation risk by say fish using those littoral areas would put um, fish out into the water column and be f therefore more exposed um, to uh, this multi predation multiple predation situation. And th in that situation, then um, aspects such as uh, escape speed might become much more important. And so looking at the right side there gives you a perspective on sort of um, why this is important. And this, this shows the lower river survival based on um, uh, water temperature in the lower river. And each of those points represents a record of water temperature. And you can see that there's a strong temperature dependent signal here that uh, survival declines as a function of temperature and really drops off right around sort of the 20 degree mark. And that 20 degree mark is not explained by bioenergetics alone. Fish can certainly um, do well at those temperatures. But what uh, the authors did for this study was overlay sort of this, um, these, these, these empirical findings 
with uh, other observations. So the red line there is the relative change in predation risk as a function of temperature. And that relative change can come, up, uh, come uh, about, for example, just by increased activities of, of predators within the water system. And in addition, they uh, put in context the blue line, which is uh, the relative change in um, swim performance at different temperatures. And the overlap or the intersection of those two relationships really sort of points to a, a loss of um, sort of mitigation of predation really right around that threshold of 20 degrees. And so uh, it's un unclear why we see this uh, decline in swim performance, but that seems to be a pretty, pretty important predictor in, the, in conjunction with our understanding of the non-native predators of, of why we see really low survival at high temperatures. All right, so that gives you a sense of, of some of the uh, spatial and temporal contexts of climate change. Now I'm going to shift to thinking uh, a sort of from a longer time scale about uh, life history differences. And so next slide for that. And so this uh, finding is focused on uh, spring run Chinook salmon in the Central Valley. They used to op, uh, have a very wide distribution in the Central Valley, but now really sort of uh, um, remain in just a couple of river systems in the Northern Sacramento area. Uh, and so that's shown on the map on the left side. And what's really interesting is that these spring run populations have different out migration types. And so you can have early migrants. And so those types are represented uh, by those graphs in the middle uh, showing uh, with, with different color bars showing where they are in their migration. And, and that's understood based on um, microstructure and chemistry of, of ear bones of these migrants. And so what we see is that there's sort of three general strategies. There's an early migrant fish migrating out of Mill and, and Deer Creek, their natal streams, uh, at very small size, migrating downstream for an extended rearing within the lower watershed and delta before migrating out. And then you have this intermediate migrant, uh, basically extending residence within Mill and Deer Creek for a greater period of time before migrating and showing less of a rearing um, downriver. And then you have the late migrants. And these are essentially yearling fish rearing, uh, overwintering within Mill and Deer Creek before leaving. And because uh, the authors had also access to ad adult uh, ear bones, they were able to look at the relative success of these different life history types in different years with different temperature. And that's shown on the right side there. And so there's uh, basically the, um, we see several different years. So for example, at the bottom row is year 2000, return year 2007. And those corresponding to fish leaving the river system in years 2004 and 2005, which are relatively cold. That cold is illustrated by those little thermometers on the right side. And that's uh, in contrast to say a return year 2018 corresponding to emigration years 2015 and 2018, where uh, those emigration temperatures are very, very warm. And what the authors found was that in those cooler years, basically had equal success of the different three different life history types. But as temperatures warmed, you had much higher success. In fact, total sort of uh, the success was dependent upon one type, and that was those yearling fish. And um, it's important from the perspective of understanding these uh, life history variants for sort of predicting sort of overall performance within the Central Valley where you have uh, many of these systems blocked now by dams. And so those, those yearling strategies are restricted to only a very few of the river systems. So the next example I wanna give, next slide, is, is asking about when you take out some of that life history diversity, what happens to the population will stay on the Central Valley uh, where there's a hugely long record that um, Stu Munch, 
myself and colleagues at the Southwest Center uh, put together. And so focusing on the entire time series of harvest that's recorded for California fisheries and asking how that harvest as sort of our metric of fishery performance has changed with respect to various climate indicators um, over, over the time period and whether that's linked to a number of sort of specific changes in the population. And the idea is that a sort of combination of a number of factors shown in the middle there, habitat destruction, dams, hatcheries, um, water extraction, and so forth, basically have exacerbated situations and concentrated risk uh, into specific years. And so what that has resulted, what appears a new way, is that from a historical perspective, fish were able to, uh, the, the, the fish life history diversity was able to mitigate um, really poor conditions in particular years. And so the, the population was responding to smooth impacts of drought across multiple years. Whereas now more recently, the combined effects in addition to climate change has resulted in a, high sensi a much higher sensitivity of stocks and fishing performance to specific annual events of temperature or, or precipitation. And so you can see that in the record. Next slide. And so what we have here are two uh, sets of time series. On the left is the historical time series, essentially going from the 1800s uh, to 1960. And on the right is the contemporary time series going from the 70s to present. And the black dots and lines on each of these plots are, is the uh, fishery performance. And then uh, what we show here are some of the predictors of fishery performance. And so on the left side and the right is um, purple, which is basically the average precipitation over two um, to five years for each of that sort of fishing year. Um, and so let's just start there. What we see historically is that the population uh, or the fishing performance tracked um, that average performance pretty well. And you can see that really clearly in sort of the 1940 to 1960 period where you had increases in fishery performance uh, positively associated with precipitation patterns over the, the previous two to five years. That's in contrast to specific years of temperature, of, of precipitation swings shown in the blue line on the bottom panel on the left. And so that there's, there's basically huge variation in precipitation, but uh, during that historical period, there wasn't a strong tracking by fish, in fishery performance. And now we sort of compare that with more contemporary time periods, and that's on the right side there. And, that, and what we saw was in addition to sort of the effects of precipitation, we had also eff effects of temperature coming in. Um, and, and basically a loss of that sort of average, time averaged um, tracking and more increasingly a tracking to specific extremes. And so you can see that uh, looking at the top right panel time series. And so here, if you look at the purple line, which is again, the average precipitation for two to five years, um, you, see, you see some pattern, but it, it tracks less compared to historically. And in, um, what we see when we look at the bottom panel is a really strong correspondence in either uh, higher effects of temperature um, or precipitation in particular years. And so you can see that in the spikiness between uh, 1990 and 2000, right in the middle of that graph, really corresponding to increases in fishery performances associated with precipitation. Um, and then later on in that time series, uh, 2010 to presence again, it's really strong correspondence in the peaks. So what this uh, means to us is that the, the, those life history uh, variability has buffered these effects of, of temperature over multiple years rather than uh, of particular years and has buffered sort of effects of drought. And so we, now we have a rising importance of this May to June air temperature. We still have this effect of precipitation, but now increasingly it's um, sort of impacting fishery 
performance on particular years. And so the population as a whole is much more susceptible to these swings of um, good and bad conditions. And as a consequence, year to year variation in returns is rising. So that's uh, sort of from a life history perspective. And now I wanna go one step further and to think about this in the context of different species. And so next slide. So here we have um, some efforts by Tim Beachy and colleagues to look at um, sort of the resilience of, of climate impacts using restoration for different species. And they've done this in the context of life cycle modeling. And so the example of Chinook salmon life cycle model is shown on the right side there, evaluating several climate impacts, increasing summer temperature, declining summer flows, increasing peak flows, and ameliorating those conditions with a number of types of restoration, such as removing barriers, increasing riparian shade, um, increasing uh, beaver activity and, and beaver ponds. So what they did was um, they looked at uh, four different species slash stocks. They looked at coho salmon, um, fall chinook salmon, spring chinook salmon, and steelhead, and created these life cycle models for all those, and then ran several different um, scenarios. Next slide. And so those scenarios uh, basically looked at single actions. So um, when we sort of look through um, various sort of time points in climate change, ask does ameliorating a, a climate change uh, affect less in population decline when we, when we change one sort of action. And then in addition to that, they looked at combinations of actions. So basically based on those single results, they looked at the top four actions at various levels of intensity and also the top five actions. And then ask how population changes um, over these, the time course of climate change in the next century is likely to benefit or um, is likely to be ameliorated by this combination of restoration actions. Next slide. So here are um, the results. And uh, so just to quickly orient you, basically on all axes is sort of the number of spawners returning at, on average for particular actions shown on the x-axis and uh, in the upper left are the sort of situations for coho, upper right fall chinook, lower left spring chinook, and then lower right steelhead. And you see three different um, uh, boxes and those corresponds to current conditions in red and then sort of the climate change effects illustrated at mid-century by green and late century by blue. And so uh, for all sort of these um, single restoration actions, uh, we, we can basically compare those with the far left of the graph, which is the no action um, scenario. And what we can see is that for all, under all sort of actions, we observe a decline based on climate change. Regardless of what you do, we, we, we see these lower levels of, fit, of spawning abundance as a consequence of those three climate impacts that I showed you before. But uh, um, there are certain actions which um, result in less of a decline, and certain species seem less uh, affected by climate change. So you can compare, for example, spring chinook, which shows some pretty huge uh, changes over those time courses in the number of spawners, with coho right above it on the left side, which show a much more sort of compact changes in numbers. And so that's the uh, effects of single changes. And so um, they also wanted to look at sort of a combination of restoration efforts. Next slide. So here they um, looked at the top four conditions at various levels of intensity and the top five at various levels of intensity. And so they, they showed some pretty big differences in the changes in spawners and results of these cumulative benefits of restoration. Species less vulnerable to climate change responded more to the restoration efforts. And so that was particularly true of Coho and Fall Chinook. Essentially, it took less uh, restoration effort um, to produce populations which showed an increase in spawning. 
those vulnerable species required a lot more restoration effort. So spring Chinook and steelhead in particular took a lot more intensity of efforts of the sort of top five restoration strategies just to break even essentially um, for the climate impacts. So uh, this uh, really illustrates not only sort of the importance of multiple actions um, for uh, benefiting species and uh, sort of uh, climate response, but also um, highlights that um, certain actions are going to have a lot more beneficial effect in combination. So that's a, a really quick and dirty sort of summary of several of the studies we've recently produced. And um, so I just want to return to sort of this question and, and sort of put it this in a, a fisheries management sort of implications perspective. And so there's two general categories I've listed here. One sort of the sort of idea of fisheries management in the context of forecasting, but also from the perspective of recovery actions that council can support. From a forecasting perspective, these ideas of better context can help inform the right scales to apply climate impacts or relate uh, various ecosystem indicators with salmon life histories. And from a recovery standpoint, these examples highlight the importance of improving habitat conditions at early life stages. And also the idea that measures besides the abundance and productivity metrics are important for resilient fisheries. And so in addition, uh, what we saw particularly with the life cycle modeling was the importance of a, a number of recovery actions uh, to improve conditions for multiple species. And, and what that really points to is that we, there's no real sno smoking gun for um, changing the effects of climate change. We really have to do sort of multiple actions. That appreciation of these contexts, whether it's spatial variation, life history variation, species difference, and otherwise, um, that appreciation of that context should help improve our ability to successfully manage salmon stocks so that they can express their natural resilience. And with that, I thank you and be happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Questions for Corey on his presentation? Chris Curtin. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Brian. Sure. And Corey, I uh, really appreciate the presentation. Um, it's a topic of high interest to so many of us. Um, had a question on slide 12 and 13. Um, those species listed, I assume I may have just missed it. Um, so this is one part of a two part, I think. These are uh, within the same geographic area that the earlier slides. So, so California, Central Valley, I think. Is that correct? Are you referring, uh, I just want to make sure we're on the right slide. Yeah, that's uh, the correct one. You, okay, that's, so this is actually modeling that's been done for the Chehalis River system. Ah, I, I, okay. I forgot to mention that, my apologies. And then if I could follow up on the next slide, and again, I apologize, I may have missed this part, but I grasp, I think that the for instance, top four is pulling the most effective four options from the prior slide. But can you briefly re-describe what the percent value reflects on this slide? Yeah, so this basically describes the change in, the, um, in sort of the area the, of those efforts. So for example, the top four actions is changing shade by 25% floodplain by 25%, beaver ponds and so forth for that increase by 25% and so forth for um, increasing by 50 and 75. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Um, Chair Grolnick. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. If you can go to slide six, please. Um, th this addressed the temperature impacts uh, on survival. And, and I guess I'm curious, how and to what extent you distinguished temperature from flow because they, they would be correlated because lower flow might bring you warmer temperatures. So I'm just curious if you teased out the differences between temperature per se versus lower flows. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And um, I would say that a lot of this, I mean, 
you, your effects of temperature and flow are going to co-vary. And so when you have higher flow rates, you're, you're generally going to have lower temperatures. And so you, it might be sort of thinking about this from um, sort of what conditions are affecting um, the fish at that time period versus sort of what you could do about it, right? It might be um, is the, uh, the mechanisms are hypothesized to affect, say, me meta metabolics of certain, these predators. And so it's, it's much more of a temperature effect than a flow effect in that respect. But if we were to sort of manage the system, we might turn to, say, uh, pulsed flows to um, better sort of produce conditions in which fish can get through the system. And, and of a follow-up, if I may, um, while this presentation is focused on climate change, um, there's also the anthropogenic changes in water conditions uh, that are independent of climate change. So to what extent have you considered those? Uh, and I, I guess by way of example, um, uh, temperatures have risen and flows have dropped as a consequence of decisions made by, for example, the Bureau of Reclamation to provide water to agricultural folks. So to what extent could these impacts of climate change be moderated by changes in um, water management and priorities? Yeah, that's an, a really important question and was really the highlight when we looked at this 170 year, year time series. We wanted to get sort of not only sort of the effects of um, changing temperature and precipitation, but also as you point out, um, the fact that the system has changed a huge amount. And so what, um, what that really involves for that analysis, I didn't go into the details when I presented it, but look, um, there were certain time periods in which we had to sort of um, at least uh, incorporate the idea that, say, um, your effective precipitation is going to be modulated by the creation of multiple dams in the system. And, and uh, the way Stu did that was to break up that time series into particular chunks, recognizing that you had these changes um, that created um, a different level of variability for, say, precipitation and its potential effect on the fishery performance. So uh, to answer your question generally, I think it's a really huge issue, especially when we're thinking retrospectively, um, not only considering sort of large scale temperature or um, other changes, but also thinking about sort of the course of environmental impacts that we've uh, thrown at salmon along the way. All right, and, and one last follow-up. Uh, thank you for your uh, for your help here. Uh, on slide 11, you list resilience strategies. I, I don't see listed there um, uh, water flows or water management or steps that could be taken. Um, uh, because as others have noted, um, it, you know, if you have, even if you have shade and, and proper sediment and whatnot, if you don't have enough water at the right temperature flowing. So I guess, um, is there a reason why um, it not listed as a resilient strategy is, it, is improved quality of flows? Yeah, so uh, this was um, in the context of the Ch Chehala system where um, sort of, um, modulating the flows via, say, releases from dams was much less of an issue. I mean, the, the broader context of this was actually looking at sort of what the impacts might be from construction of a new dam for um, flood control. Um, but uh, the question about sort of water release strategies did not rise to the level of attention as co compared to these other um, recovery actions, which could in, those, in that system. But if you apply the same context, um, same life cycle modeling concept to other systems, you definitely want to incorporate that probably in, um, in the, the range of um, recovery actions. All right, thank you, because I think the Klamath and Sacramento and San Joaquin systems are largely crippled by flows. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, Joe Grolnick. Um, further questions for Corey? Oh, Susan Bishop. Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, uh, Corey, I just have a question on slide five. I notice um, it, um, your last bullet there says ch changes are due entirely to distributional shifts, not productivity shifts. And if I understand the graphic correctly, um, it shows a fairly um, significant change in abundance between the two scenarios in the California for the Southern region and some increase in abundance um, uh, in the Northern region. Region, so I'm assuming that's that. If you're talking about distributional shifts, you're shifting abundance from sort of you anticipate abundance will shift from the south towards the north, but there doesn't seem to be sort of a commiserate shift in that abundance. Um, you've a fairly significant reduction in abundance compared to a relatively minor increase as you go north. Um, am I reading the graph incorrectly, or is there also some aspect of productivity that plays in here? There's no uh, change in productivity. It's it's really just sort of uh, matching where those temperature changes are with respect to the sort of um, based on the sort of current conditions, where they would go in the, in the future based on the, the different temperatures. And um, I should point out that those are the, the um, on the x-axis, those are the regions again. And so you have multiple stocks responding to that, not just, say, the Northern California stock um, shifting its distribution. I don't know if that quite answers your question. But I mean, I would, I think uh, if you have specific questions about why you got some of those results, that would be a really good question for the authors and not for me. I'm just kind of the, the middleman here. Thank you, Susan. Further questions? Okay, thank you, Corey. Thank you very much. You bet. Um, well, that'll take us to uh, management bodies and advisory panels, and I don't think we have any comments, and um, I don't believe there's any public comment. What? What? Oh, we have one comment? Okay. Wait, that comes up to the screen here. Very days. Okay. Okay, and um, I see Barry Day. Barry, are you there? Excuse my manners. I pushed the wrong public comment on for the next agenda on the tentative adoption. Okay, you're, you're good to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back. Are we on tentative adoption now, are we? Oh, oh. No, no, we're not. It'll be the next time around. Yeah, 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 excuse me. I'll push the wrong button there. I'm a busy boy. Okay, thank you. Very good. <laughs> okay, with that, that would take us to council action. And uh, there's no motion here, but certainly council discussion. I'd open the floor up for that. If anyone would so desire. And if... Yeah, I, I want to thank the uh, Science Center again for the uh, report they had on uh, basically the challenges our salmon stocks face in, 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 with with climate change. <clears throat> but I but I also think that in, in as the council thinks about these issues, um, we can't. Uh, it's not within our portfolio to do anything about climate change, and even if it were, we'd be powerless to do that. Um, but there are a lot of the stressors, um, are on top of climate change. Uh, and, and again, I'm focusing more on our systems in California, but I'm sure there's, you know, the same or, or analogous stressors are, are seen in other systems where the priorities of these native species, uh, are put lower, uh, than, some introduced species like almonds 
So um, I, I don't know, you know, I think I don't, there's really nothing for us to do at this point on this agenda item, but I do think we need to uh, keep the focus here uh, to the extent we can, to the extent we have the prerogative to, to weigh in um, in favor of our native species uh, in their own right, as well as in support of the fisheries that we manage. Thank you, Mark. Further discussion? All right, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll look to uh, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think you have wrapped up agenda item D1. Thank you. Okay, very good. Well, with that, we'll go straight into uh, D2. When you're ready. Thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D2, the tentative adoption of the 2022 management measures for analysis. So the council adopted three management alternatives in March, which were published in preseason report two and sent out for public review. The council also hosted three public hearings to provide public comment, and we have the supplemental reports on the outcome of those hearings available for you under this agenda item as well. So under this agenda item, the council is scheduled to narrow the management alternatives to a single alternative for analysis by the STT and to allow adequate analysis before final adoption. The tentatively adopted recommendation should resolve any outstanding conflicts and be as close as possible to the final management measures. Any agreements by outside parties, such as the North of Falcon Forum, to be incorporated into the Council's recommendations must be presented to the Council prior to adoption of the tentative options. Procedure also stipulates that any new alternatives or analysis must be reviewed by the STT and the public prior to the Council's final adoption. The management measures considered for adoption that deviate from the fishery management plan objectives will require implementation by emergency rule. And if an emergency rule appears to be necessary, the council must clearly identify and justify the need for the action consistent with criteria established by the council, which is provided in attachment one, and by NEMPS, which is provided in attachment two. So the STT will check back with the council on Friday, April 9th under agenda item D3 to clarify any questions or problems with the tentative measures. So the action under this agenda item is to adopt tentative 2022 ocean salmon management measures for analysis. You have quite a bit of uh, reference material under this agenda item. Um, we have the three reports from, well, we'll start with the STT report. They'll um, let you know any changes that have come up since we last met in March. We'll have three uh, reports from each one of the states on the public hearings. And then we'll also have a report on the Pacific Salmon Commission uh, progress. And we'll hear from the North of Cape Falcon Forum and then follow that up with the management and advisory body reports where we have some, uh, an SAS report with their uh, preferred alternative uh, for this first go round and some tribal reports. And also under this agenda item, we did have, um, I'm sure you all have noticed quite a bit of public comment, uh, written public comment. Um, and then I'm not sure, it doesn't look like we have anybody signed up at this moment for, um, uh, verbal comment here at the council meeting. So I think that wraps up my summary. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, questions for Robin oh, on our overview. And I, I believe you mentioned check it. We'll check back on Saturday, not Friday. Been today's Friday, so. <laughs> It's all good. Okay, with that, we'll look to uh, Dr. O'Farrell, the, the SAT report. Michael? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council members. Um, since the March Council meeting, the STT has 
gone back and looked through the models and uh, provided up, uh, incorporated updates that uh, you know typically come between the March and April council meeting. Um, and I'll go through those uh, uh, briefly. With and I'll start with the Chinook changes. There are now updated uh, Canadian and uh, Oregon coastal Chinook forecasts uh, provided by DFO and ODFW through the Pacific Salmon Commission. There are updated troll and sport fishery inputs uh, in Northern BC and West Coast Vancouver Island to reflect 2022 tax as determined by the abundance indices produced from the CTC's annual PSC Chinook model calibration. And there are um, updated Puget Sound fishery inputs. Um, moving to Coho, um, there are updated Canadian 2022 abundances um, per US data, uh, US Canada data change uh, that occurred on March 15th. Uh, there are updated Puget Sound fishery inputs, updated Columbia River fishery inputs. And, uh, but one note, uh, the Washington Coastal Terminal fisheries, including Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor, continue to reflect 2021 fisheries. The results of these updates can be found in um, agenda item D2A, the supplemental STT report. Um, this report consists of uh, tables five and seven that uh, you're familiar with from uh, the pre two report and throughout the March council meeting. Um, but they've been, um, in addition to being updated, they've been augmented with an adding in um, some more uh, Puget Sound stocks. Um, I'll note that uh, starting on page, I don't have the page number here, but on the first page for Chinook, um, the Southern Resident Killer Whale Prey Abundance has been recalculated and uh, the result of the, update, uh, the updated inputs is a small increase in starting abundance uh, uh, relative to the abundance reported in pre-2. Um, going down um, through in the Puget Sound section, there are a number of Puget Sound stocks that uh, are not currently meeting management objectives, although uh, I understand that that is typical at this stage in the game at the April Council meeting. Um, just noting that um, if not meeting objectives, uh, uh, that's indicated by uh, bolding. Turning the page, um, uh, there's one uh, Washington Coastal Chinook um, stock that is not meeting its uh, it's a management objectives under all three alternatives, Hoko Fall. Um, and moving down toward the Columbia River, uh, Columbia River Natural Tules, under all three alternatives, the 38% maximum exploitation rate um, is being exceeded. And uh, there were very minimal, um, almost undecipherable changes in California um, for the California stocks, and the, the core results remain the same. Moving on to Coho, um, there are um, the Hood Canal under Alternative One has an exploitation rate that um, exceeds the maximum allowable um, for that stock, and that is um, the only thing of note to point out, I think, for um, the coho stocks at this time. Um, again, um, I, I will not go into great detail on this, but um, I'll refer to that table uh, seven is in this uh, report as well. It's a two page table <clears throat> as it was um, during the March council meeting. Um, and it shows a breakdown of the exploitation rates for LCN coho, OCN co coho, Lower Columbia River Tules and uh, Song Coho. So that concludes my uh, the STT's update um, on uh, changes that have been made since uh, the March Council meeting, and I can try to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Mike. Questions for uh, Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Dr. O'Farrell, I guess the one other stock on the co page I noted on table five was under alternative one, the interior Fraser is at 10.7 above the 10.0 threshold. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I, I missed that. Thanks, Phil. 
Can you, anyone else? Okay. Thank you. All right, that'll take us to um, D2B, Summary of Public Hearings, and uh, look to Kyle Addix. Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Agenda item D2B, Supplemental Public Hearing Report 1, is a summary of the Washington hearing, which occurred on the evening of Tuesday, March 22nd. It was held online again this year, and representatives included myself, Mr. Jeremy Jording from the National Marine Fishery Service, Mr. Chris German from the U.S. Coast Guard, Dr. Jim Seeger from the council staff, Mr. Kyle Vandegraaff from the Salmon Technical Team, and council members Phil Anderson and Butch Smith also attended. We had just over 30 participants, um, went through our normal, just sort of brief overview of the outlook for the year and a review of the alternatives for the um, commercial and recreational salmon seasons and incidental hal halibut retention in the troll fishery. There's a summary of the public testimony. We just had a handful of people um, testify. We had a representative of the Washington Trollers Association provide comment. They supported alternative one and the higher quotas of 65,000 Chinook and 210,000 coho, along with season structures that would maximize the efficiency of the troll fishery. Um, they supported the package and noticed that the 65,000 Chinook TAC was consistent with the long-term Lower Columbia, Lower Columbia River Thule Chinook exploitation rate that's been attributed to ocean troll fisheries in the past when coho weren't the primary constraint for the fishery. Uh, they pointed out the, the need to um, balance the seasons and provide a strong fishery and the importance of that to both the fleet and the fishery dependent small businesses and the coastal communities. Three people provided comment on the recreational fishery, including representatives of the Puget Sound Anglers Ocean Chapter and the Westport Charter Boat Association. Um, similar to the commercial testimony, Alternative 1 was favored. Um, the representatives emphasized the need to have a, the longest season possible while meeting our Endangered Species Act guidelines, as well as um, returning healthy number of spawners to river, coho spawners to rivers like the Queeds, where we're under a rebuilding plan. Um, they noted at that time that there, the alternatives were over in two cases on Columbia River natural tules, but there were um, fisheries to the north that had yet to be resolved as to their impact for this year's fisheries. Um, and again, they, the preference was for a seven day a week fishery, but, but a, a stress on keeping the season as long as possible. Um, one individual testified on the Lower Columbia Thule conservation concern and, and pointed out that we will have to plan fisheries that meet the ESA constraints for that stock. Um, that's all they had, but they, if uh, Mr. Smith or Mr. Anderson had anything to add, as I said, they were both there too. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kyle. Questions for Kyle on his uh, report? Okay, next to Chris Kern, Oregon. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yep, so we had our Oregon meeting on March 23rd. Uh, I was there as the council representative. We were joined by uh, Tony Siniscal from National Marine Fisheries, Mr. Chris German, uh, Ms. Robin Elke from council staff, and uh, Ms. Emily Shallow from Oregon as the STT rep. Uh, we had about 27 people on the online meeting. That includes the uh, representatives listed above, as well as some other agency staff that, that joined in. Um, after going over the initial alternatives, we had about five people test testify. Uh, one of those was primarily for the commercial uh, side of, of the uh, alternatives. The rest were recreational. Uh, we didn't receive any comments on the incidental halibut issues. On the commercial side, uh, the testimony from the one person um, preferred an alternative one, um, particularly noting that it allowed the uh, fishers a better opportunity to work around weather and that if uh, that wasn't possible, they preferred alternative two over alternative three, uh, but also stated that none of the options were all that great. Uh, on the recreational side, we had uh, three um, anglers that preferred alternative one. One, had, uh, one of those asked for a start date on the coho mark selective fishery that was earlier than any of the three alternatives, uh, but another advocated for keeping it uh, at a later date. Uh, one angler testified regarding the Oregon KMZ fisheries um, and preferred alternative three with an addition of a coho season for that area, which didn't uh, wasn't part of alternative three, but was in the other two. 
Uh, we had two comments in opposition to closures of the recreational Chinook fishery in August, which existed in alternative three. And we had uh, uh, one testify in support of the non-mark selective coho fishery uh, in September. And one also asked that we uh, try to leave some room uh, on OCN impacts to cover potential freshwater uh, fisheries in Oregon. And that's, uh, uh, we did have, a, I guess I will mention, we had a, one concern, I think it's a, uh, also been followed by a written testimony, uh, pointing out some uh, uh, um, observations of the model performance and calculation of impacts in recreational uh, Chinook fishing in Oregon, and just simply noting that the uh, outputs in pre-2 did not seem to match up very well with observed past catches. So that's all I have, thanks. Thank you, Chris. Questions for Chris? Okay, seeing then on to California and uh, Marcy, oh, I mean, <laughs> Mark Grelnick, sorry. All right, thank you, yeah. Vice Chair Pettinger. So um, the California public hearing took place on Tuesday, uh, March 22nd. And in attendance, besides myself as the hearing officer, was, were uh, Ms. Shannon Penna on behalf of the National Marine Fishery Service, Lieutenant Lilia Lingo, for the Coast Guard, uh, of course, Ms. Robin Elke for council staff, and for the salmon technical team, Ms. Candace Morgenstern uh, of California, CDF, of CDFW. It was a very, very well attended uh, hearing. We had about 85 participants, uh, including in, uh, some other council members from California. Um, I provided um, some opening remarks, and then Ms. Morgenstern uh, presented uh, uh, the, the various alternatives and uh, salmon seasons, uh, basically a, a great presentation, a lot of information for those in attendance to consider and bring everyone up to speed. We had uh, 28 public commenters, 10 on the commercial troll fishery and 18 on the recreational fishery in California. Uh, on the uh, commercial side, uh, there was support for alternative one, but there was some discussion about changing the opportunities, moving them around a bit. Um, and there was also a discussion about uh, a, a, a using a boundary line to provide for more uh, opportunity uh, there was there was some support for alternative two, but generally there was most support for alternative one. There was a suggestion to change uh, the size limit to provide a call in line to report catch, um, and there was concern about where uh, forcing uh, trawlers to travel a great distance to land their fish. Um, would, would increase uh, their carbon footprint. So there was some concern about that. And uh, there was a request to remove, to review the model uh, that uh, ended up reducing the uh, impact to um, an age four Klamath, the proxy for California coastal Chinook um, from 16 to 10%. There's still a little bit of heartburn over that left over from the March meeting. Uh, on, the, on the sport side, there was general support for alternative one or a combination of alternatives one and three. Uh, specifically relating to opportunity in June to, to provide some op opportunity in June. There was some discussion uh, in the North about uh, July 4th versus Labor Day. Um, there wasn't a lot of discussion from the Monterey zone. Um, and there was also a discussion about putting in a further management line at Pedro Point to create a new zone. And uh, that was discussed at some length about uh, the difficulty of establishing such a line. And that was um, that was our hearing. Thank you, Chair Grolick. Um, questions on the uh, California report? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Well, I think that'll take us to the D2C and recommendations of the U.S. section of the Pacific Salmon Commission and Phil Anderson. Phil? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. 
Um, I'll be referring to agenda item D2C, uh, which is uh, the Civic Salmon Commission CTC report one. And that is the document, uh, the memo from the Chinook Technical Committee to the Pacific Salmon Commission having to do with the conclusion of their work relative to the AABM fisheries preseason abundance indices for 2022 and the postseason abundance indices for 2021. This work uh, results in, in two very important pieces of information. Uh, one that feed directly into our process here, the other which is used by the Pacific Salmon Commission in evaluating its management of it of the fisheries. The Chinook Technical Committee uh, completed the calibration of the Pacific Salmon Commission Chinook model for 2022. Um, the results you can see in for um, the preseason catch, pre, uh, excuse me, for the um, preseason abundance for um, and catch limits for Northern BC and WCVI, you can see are in table one. Uh, you also see the value for the Southeast Alaska fishery, which is determined uh, utilizing a, um, inf utilizes information coming out of the a winter troll fishery in, this, in Southeast Alaska. Also in uh, table B, which is, um, is the results relative to the 2021 preseason abundances, the observed catches in the postseason abundance indices uh, and the associated annual uh, catches for the 2021 AB, ABM fisheries, which we will be using uh, within the Pacific Salmon Commission form. So that information uh, was provided um, uh, to the, our uh, salmon technical team, and I believe that information is currently being used uh, in, or will be used in the modeling that is done uh, as we work our way through the preseason process and finalize the 2022 regulations for the um, Pacific Council Fisheries later this week. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Phil. Questions for Phil on the his report? Okay. <clears throat> Not seeing any hands. Very good. Next, we go to the um, recommendations of the North of Cape Falcon Forum, and um, I believe uh, Joe and Kyle Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. The, we've been going through our normal North of Falcon process over the past month, um, continuing that work obviously up into and through this week. So I don't have any specific recommendations right now, but um, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next, that will take us to the SS report. And I look to uh, Richard. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We'll bring up the commercial representatives first and begin with those. Uh, while we're doing that, I would like to again take the opportunity to thank the council and council staff for having us here in person. Uh, as you can see, we've done a lot of work and it's very, very helpful for us to be here present together and working face to face. So we appreciate that very much. So we'll begin with uh, Washington and Ryan Johnson. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'll be reading the commercial troll management alternatives for North of Falcon. <clears throat> the overall non-Indian attack of 60,000 Chinook, 200,000 coho with a marked with a healed adipose fin. The non-Indian commercial troll attack of 30,000 Chinook and 32,000 marked coho. Fisheries prior to May 16, see the 2021 management measures 
which are subject to in-season changes uh, to 2022 description below. In May 1 through 15, see the 21 measures um, modified through in-season action to match below. May 16 through the earlier of June 29th, or 20,000 Chinook, no more than 6,710 between the Canadian border and Queets River, no more than 5,380 between Ledbetter and Falcon, open seven days a week. Um, between the Canadian border and Queets River, landing a possession of 100 Chinook per vessel per week, Thursday to Wednesday, from Ledbetter to Falcon is also 100 Chinook per vessel per week. All salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size 27 inches. When it is estimated that approximately 50% of the quota or sub-area guideline has been landed, in-season action may be considered so that quotas and guidelines are not exceeded. In 2023, the season will open May 1, consistent with preseason regulations in place in this area and sub-areas during May 16 through June 29th of 2022 including guidelines, quotas, weekly vessel limits, except as described below for vessels fishing or in possession of salmon north of Ledbetter Point. This opening could be modified following council review at its March and April meeting, 2023. July 1 through the earlier of September 30th, 10,000 Chinook, or 32,000 March coho, open seven days per week, all salmon. Chinook minimum size 27 inches, coho minimum size 16 inches total length, um, Alcoa must be marked with a heeled adipose fin. No chum retention north of Cape Alava in August and September. Landing a possession of 150 mark coho per vessel per week, Thursday to Wednesday. <clears throat> the uh, last portion of the table has the uh, conservation and control zone closures. Um, vessels must land, or, land and deliver within 24 hours of any fishery closure may not land east of the CQ River or east of the Astoria Megala Bridge. And then there's the call-in requirements uh, having to do with the line at Ledbetter Point and the Queets River line, and also a uh, paragraph on requirements landing into Oregon. That concludes the North of Falcon. Good afternoon, council members, staff. Um, my name is Mark Newell, uh, Oregon Salmon uh, Advisor, Troll Advisor. For uh, Cape Falcon to heck of the bank line, March 15th through May 15th, May 16th through 31st, June 1st through the 30th, July 5th through 9th, 17th through the 21st, 25th through the 31st, August 4th through the 11th, September 1st through October 31st, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size of 28 inches total length, all vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon, and there are gear restrictions in definition C2 and th 3. July 5th through 9th, 17th through 21st, 25th through 31st, in August 4th to 11th, from Cape Falcon to Humbug, a quarter of 10,000 marked coho. All salmon, all retained coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin clip. If the coho quota for the combined area from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain of 10,000 marked coho is met, then the season continues for all salmon except coho in the remaining open days. Coho minimum size limit of 16 inches total length and Chinook minimum size of 28 inches total length. All vessels fished in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. Salmon trollers may take and retain or possess on board a fishing vessel no more than 30 coho per vessel per open period and all coho retained possessed on a vessel and landed must not exceed a one to one ratio with Chinook salmon that are retained and landed at the same time. Beginning September 1st, no more than 100 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week, Thursday through Wednesday. In 2023, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length. Gear restrictions same as 2022. 
Executive Bank Line to Humbug Mountain, May 1st through 15th, 16th through 31st, August 4th through 11th, September 1st through October 31st. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, schnookman and size them at 28 inches total length. All vessels fishing the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. August 4th to 11th, or Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, court of 10,000 Mark Coho. The same restrictions as above. Salmon trawlers must take and retain or possess on board a fishing vessel no more than 30 coho per vessel per open period. All coho retained possessed on a vessel on land must not exceed a one to one ratio with Chinook salmon that are retained and landed at the same time. Beginning September 1st, no more than 100 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week, Thursday through Wednesday. From hum Humbug Mountain to the Oregon-California border, March 15th through, the, through April 30th, June 1st through the 30th or earlier of an 800 Chinook quota, July 1st through the 31st or earlier of a 400 Chinook quota, August 1st through the 28th or earlier of a 200 Chinook quota, 250, excuse me, Chinook quota. Open seven days per week, Thursday through Wednesday, all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. All, prior to June 1st, all salmon caught in this area must be landed and delivered in the state of Oregon. June 1st through August 28th, weekly lamin and possession limit of 50 Chinook per vessel per week, Thursday through Wednesday. Any remaining portion of Chinook quotas may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the next open quota period. All vessels fishing in this area during June, July, and August must land and deliver all salmon within this area into Port Orford or within 24 hours of any closure of this fishery and prior to fishing outside of this area. For all quota managed season, the Oregon State regulations require fishers to notify ODF and W within one hour of landing and prior to transport away from the port of landing by calling a number or sending notification via email to the troll ODF and W vessel name, number, number of salmon species, location, delivery, estimate, time of delivery. In 2023, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches. Gate restrictions same as 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2023 meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Council staff. Um, I'm George Bradshaw, California Commercial Troll SAS rep, and I'll continue down the coast, um, starting at latitude 4010 north to Point Arena, the Fort Bragg zone. We'll open July 8th through the 12th and the 23rd through the 27th, and then August 3rd through the 12th. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho. Uh, sea gear compliance requirements, restrictions, definitions, Chinook minimum size limit, 27 inches total length. All salmon must be landed in California and north of Point Arena. In 2023, the season will open April 16th for all salmon except coho. Minimum size limit, 27 inches total length. Same restrictions as 2022. The opening period may be modified to council review and it's March 2023 meeting. Um, moving down a little further, Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco Cell. Opening dates will be July 8th through the 12th and 23rd through the 27th, August 3rd through the 12th, September 1 through 30. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho. Uh, Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches, total length through August, then 26 inches thereafter. Uh, same gear requirements, compliance definitions, all salmon must be landed in California. During September, all salmon must be landed south of Point Arena. Uh, in 2023, the season will open May 1, all salmon except coho, minimum Chinook size limit, 27 inches total length, same gear restrictions as 
2022. The opening date may be modified council review at its March or April 2023 meeting. And to the point raised, Point San Pedro, fall target area, opening date would be October 3 through 7 and 10 through 14. Open five days a week, Monday through Friday, all salmon except coho. Minimum size limit of 26 inches total length. All salmon caught in this area must be landed between Point Arena and Pigeon Point. See requirements, gear restrictions, definitions. Uh, moving down further from Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border. Opening days will be May 1 through 5, 10 through 15, and 20 through 24. And then June 1 through 12. July 8 through 12, 23 through 27, and then August 1 through 12, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, minimum size limit 27 inches, total length, uh, same gear requirements, restrictions, definitions, all salmon landed must be in California. In 2023, the season will open May 1, all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit 27 inches, total length, same gear restrictions as 2022. Opening date may be modified council review at its March or April 2023 meeting. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, questions for uh, Ryan, Mark, George on their proposed recommendations? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, gentlemen. And I okay. turn Thank to you. Mr. Vice Chair, we'll bring up the recreational folks next. Okay. And we will begin in Washington with Dave Johnson. Good morning, Vice Chair, members of the Council. My name is Dave Johnson, Washington Sport Rec. I'll be reading on page 10, table 2, recreational management measures. Overall non-Indian TAC, 60,000 Chinook, 200,000 Coho. Coho must be marked with the healed out as post fin. Recreational TAC, 30,000 Chinook, 168,000 marked Coho. All retained coho must be marked with a clipped adipose fin. Buoy 10 fishery opens August 1 with an expected landed catch of 55,000 marked coho in August and September. U.S. Canada border to Cape Alava, the Nia Bay sub area, will open June 18th through earlier of September 30th or 17,470 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 6,790 Chinook. Table C5, open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum beginning August 1st, two salmon per day, all coho must be marked with the healed adipose fin, Chinook minimum size limit, 24 inches total length. Beginning August 1, Chinook non-retention east of Benilla Tattoosh line, during council managed ocean fishery, see gear restrictions and definition, C2, C3. In-season management may sustain season length and keep harvest within overall Chinook and Coho recreational tax for north of Cape Falcon C5. Moving south, Cape Alava to Queets River, La Push sub area, June 18th through earlier in September 30th, or 4,370 mark Coho sub area quota with the sub area guideline of 1,115 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum, beginning August 1. Two salmon per day, all coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit, 24 inches total length. October 1 through earlier October 9 or 125 Chinook quota, C5, an area north of 47.50 north latitude and a south 4800. Open seven days a week, Chinook only, one Chinook per day. Chinook minimum size limit, 24 inches total length. Queets River to Ledbetter Point, Westport sub area, open Saturday, June 25th through earlier in September 30th, or 62,160 mark coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 13,410 Chinook. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit, 22 inches in this area. 
C gear restrictions and definition C2, C3, the Grays Harbor control zone closed beginning August 8th. In season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within overall Chinook and Coho recreational tax for north of Cape Falcon. Moving farther south to Ledbetter Point to Cape Falcon, Columbia River sub area, again open June 25th through earlier than September 30th or 84,000 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 8,560 Chinook, open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook, all coho must be marked with a heel out of post fin, Chinook minimum size limit 22 inches. And that concludes my report. Good morning, Vice Chair and Council. Oh, good morning, Vice Chair and Council. My name is Mike Sorensen, uh, SAS Oregon Charter Rep. I'll be reading from the same document, page 11. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, uh, March 5th, or May, March 5th to May 15th, May 16th to October 31st, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho. Except as provided below during the all season uh, marked selective coho fishery in the non marked selective coho fishery, two fish per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches, total length, sea gear restrictions. In 2023, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit 24 inches, total length, the season, uh, the sea gear restrictions. Opening may be modified uh, at the March 2023 20, council meeting. Cape Falcon to the Oregon border, all salmon marked selective coho fishery June 18th through the earlier of August 21st or 100,000 marked coho quota. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day. All retained coho must have a healed marked adipose fin See gear restrictions. Any remainder of the marks left coho quota may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the non select coho quota from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, non select coho fishery, September 3rd through the earlier of September 30th, or a 20,000 non mark select coho quota open seven days per week may be modified in season. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, sea minimum size limits and restrictions. Restrictions. For the Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border, the Oregon KMZ, July 1 through August 19th, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, except as listed above for the Mark Select Coho fishery from Cape Falcon to the Oregon, California border from June 18th through August 21st. Two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definition. Good morning, Council. My name is James Stone, the California Sport Rep, and I'll be reading from the same document starting on page 12. For the Oregon California border to latitude line 4010, the California KMZ, the seasons will be May 1st to May 15th, May 16th to May 31st, August 1st to September 5th. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size, 20 inches. See gear restrictions and definitions. Klamath control zone closed in August. See California state regulations for additional closures adjacent to the Smith, Eel, and Klamath rivers. In 2023, the season opens May 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size of 20 inches. From latitude line 4010 to the Point Arena, the Fort Bragg sector, the seasons will be May 1st through May 15th, May 16th through May 31st, June 1st through July 4th, July 22nd through September 30th. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size of 20 inches, sea gear restrictions and definitions in 2023. The season opens April 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size of 20 inches in total length. For the Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco cell, the seasons will be as followed. April 2nd to May 15th, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches. 
then we'll reopen on May 16th to May 31st and June 20th to November 13th. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 20 inches. See gear restrictions and definitions. In 2023, the season will open April 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size 24 inches total length. See the gear restrictions as 2022. And for the final sell of Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border or the Monterey sector, the seasons will be April 2nd to May 15th, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches, sea gear restrictions and definitions. And then May 16th to October 2nd, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total, sea gear restrictions and definitions. In 2023, the season will open April 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, with a Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches, same gear restrictions as 2022. California state regulations require all salmon to be made available to a CDFW representative for sampling immediately at Porto Landing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, questions for the SES on their uh, recreational proposed proposals? Okay, I think you're free to go. All right, next to be the tribal reports. I looked at Joe Oman. Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So under this portion, I'll be um, covering the uh, two travel reports. First one will be the supplemental travel report number two. That will be from Hoop Valley Tribe. The second one will be the uh, supplemental travel report three, testimony of Columbia River Tribes. So I think I'll um, like to start in that order. So if I could invite up uh, Justin Alvarez from the Hoopa Valley Tribe to uh, provide the uh, report. Thank you, Joe. Welcome. Thank you, Council. My name is Justin Alvarez. I'm uh, representing the Hoopa Valley Tribe. The Hoopa Valley Tribe thanks the PFMC for this opportunity to comment regarding the tentative adoption of the 2022 Salmon Management Measures for Analysis. The tribe has prosecuted its fishery for Klamath River Falls Chinook and Klamath Basin Coho Salmon on the Lower Trinity River and Mid-Klamath River since time immemorial. Exercise of our reserved fishing right and ensuring the health of our fisheries are the fundamental foundations to our existence. With regard to the 2022 Chinook Salmon Management, the tribe is concerned that all three alternatives incorporated incorporate elevated conservatism to address the excessive exploitation of listed California coastal Chinook stocks seen in recent years. The surrogate California coastal Chinook consultation standard is for no greater than a 16% Klamath River Fall Chinook ocean age four harvest rate in any year. Accordingly, the STT recommended that the PFMC adopt pre-season estimated Klamath River Fall Chinook age four harvest rates informed by the most recent observed fishery regimes and contact rates from 2015 forward. Citing concern with whether this adjustment would achieve the CCC consultation standard, NIMS revised guidance of March 2022 called for no greater than a 10% Klamath River Fall Chinook age four harvest rate for 2022 ocean fisheries. While we understand and appreciate NIMS concern for listed species protection, they have stated that the added conservatism is intended to achieve a 16% Klamath River Fall Chinook age four harvest rate by targeting a 10% rate. In the perceived balance between the interests of fisheries and the needs of the fish, the tribe is concerned that the mechanism for conserving California coastal Chinook may be overly conservative and could limit otherwise greater access to Klamath River Fall Chinook. Evaluating and correcting sources of bias in the preseason process is in the best interest of all fisheries and correcting the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model bias with regard to the estimation of Klamath River Fall Chinook Ocean Age 4 harvest rates is appropriate. However, in this case, the repercussions of compounding safeguards to protect the California Coastal Chinook include potential effects on Klamath River Fall Chinook de minimis tribal fishery opportunity. This potential consequence does not appear to have been thoroughly explored in the present suite of alternatives. 
The tribe is relentless in its quest to address water and land management conservation consistent with fishery preservation so that our cultural way and existence may be passed on to our subsequent generations. We look forward to partnering with our federal, state, and tribal co-managers con to continue to find ways in rehabilitating our once thriving fisheries. Thank you, Justin. Question for Justin on uh, his uh, tribal report. I'm not seeing any, thank you. Next will be the um, Civil Trial Report 3 with uh, Bruce Jim, I believe. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So we have Bruce Jim from the Warm Springs Tribe, and uh, I'd like to invite him to provide Please. that testimony. Bruce, I see you're, you're muted. Ah. Hello? Welcome. Uh, can you hear me all right? We, we can. Yeah. We hear you. There. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Good day, members of the council. My name is Bruce Jim Sr. I am member of the Confederated Tribes of Warren Springs, a commissioner for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, also the chairman of the Warren Springs Fish and Wildlife Committee off reservation. I have been asked to provide comments today on behalf of the four Columbia River Treaty Tribes, the Yakima Nation, Confederated Tribes of Umatilla, Reservation, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and the Nespers Tribe. As the Council works to finalize the 2022 ocean fisheries, we have some concerns relative to the Columbia River stocks. Specifically, the relationship between ocean and in-river fisheries and that some in-river fisheries shared a lot of harvest rates on stocks such as uh, LRH tulies in the lower Columbia River coho. This means that in the in-river fisheries have a bearing on ocean fisheries planning and should be of interest to the council. In past years, we have voiced our opposition to summer season mark selective fisheries, main stem fall, mark selective <clears throat> Chinook fisheries, mark selective coho fisheries, and ocean mark selective fisheries. Mark selective fisheries do not have a conservation benefit. They just allow uh, access to more hatchery fish in, in the catch. This year, we understand there's a proposal for larger mark selective recreational fishery in August and buoy 10. We have provided some comments at the earlier state planning meeting expressing our opposition to mark selective fishing at buoy 10, which we thought would appropriate would be appropriate to uh, repeat for the entire council. We try to avoid injecting our opinion on how the states choose to allocate impacts between various parts of the non-treaty fisheries. But when we see possible impacts to the treaty fisheries, we feel that we must speak up. Mark selective fishing at Buy 10 is an unwise proposal for several reasons. First, estuaries or a poor choice as an area of mark or mark selective fishery. The fish are making complex changes to adapt from salt water to fresh water. And there is evidence that release mortality may increase. There can also be a sharp, sharp temperature difference between ocean 
and the river temperatures up to 70 degrees or more in August. This temperature transition may put fish at a higher risk for release mortality. The privilege for non-Indians to buy licenses to engage in recreation, recreational or commercial fishing should not come before the treaty rights of our tribe. These hatcheries were intended to produce fish to make up for damages done by the hydro systems as the dam flooded the spawning areas and blocked access to tributaries. The tribes were promised we would have fish from these hatcheries to catch, our, catch in our fisheries. The purpose was not, was not just to increase recreational harvest and mark selective fisheries. Based on the initial review of modeling of non-treaty fall in river fisheries, we estimate that the magnitude of the mark selective fishery at Bhutan will cause an increase in the impact rate on ESA listed fall Chinook in treaty fisheries. The treaty fisheries expert expects to be able to manage for 30% total harvest rate on upriver bright. However, as the mock selective fisheries become larger in the lower Columbia, they change the clip rate of fish upstream of Bonifer compared to the clip rate at the mouth of the river mouth. This means that the wild harvest rate on listed fish is forced higher that the total harvest rate may make we manage for due to the mark selective fishery. Our preliminary analysis indicates that the wild harvest rate on Snake River Fall Chinook could be almost half a percent higher than the total rate we manage or under the terms of the U.S. versus Oregon Management Agreement. We do not, we do not want to face this risk because of non-treaty fishery decisions. The privilege to engage in recreational fishery should not come at the expense of increases in ASA impact rates in the treaty fisheries, which is guaranteed to enjoy their treaty rights. The buoy tenna has grown very large and has an enormous fish fishing power, especially a number of guided trips. This fishery has a history of exceeding its share of non-treaty fishery impacts. We are concerned that if this happens this year, it will not only have adverse impacts on other non-treaty fisheries, but could affect the treaty fisheries if the mark selective impacts are higher than expected. As COVID restrictions have been reduced, we may see more effort in recreational fisheries than we have seen in the last two years. We also note that this has been a challenging for in-river non-treaty fisheries to stay within their share of the lower river Thule impact. We suspect that the lower uh, scale of the buoy tent fisheries can also be part of this problem. Some fisheries will fish at both buoy tent as well as other fisheries following the fish upstream. Finally, the mark selective fishery won't do anything to reduce overall treaty and not treaty impacts to its ESA listed stocks. It simply shifts the impacts from landed catch to release mortality. It will increase the wild impacts upstream for both main stem treaties and tributary treaty, <laughs> main stem treaty fisheries and tributary treaty and non-treaty fisheries because of the change in mark rate from selective fishery. It appears that the main justification for this proposal is to extend fisheries through Labor Day, just, in, just as in years, recent years. This may simple, simply not be large enough for the buoy tent fishery to go through Labor Day. If this is such an important goal, then it seems like it would be more practical to start the buoy tent fishery later 
so that it can go through the desired date and let people keep and eat the fish that they catch. Fish were provided by the Creator as a source of food for people willing to care for the salmon. And we are not showing we care for these fish by hooking them, injuring them, and tossing them back. In other words, you know, high grade salmon, uh, such as upriver brights, when you call it a lower river tule uh, fishery in Buiten, all of this comes to economics on what people were concerned about making uh, money and stuff off of sales and everything else down in the lower Columbia River. That's what this is all about. You know, they're not concerned about the, uh, the dire straits that the salmon are in, as long as they're down there to uh, fish. And that's the reason why we say uh, licensed uh, buyer to get this fish is only a privilege that they can get and not guaranteed to catch anything. Whereas a retained um, treaty issue is something that was given to us by the treaty by the United States government. And when we talk about the United States government, we talk about the building of the dams and the promises that was made at that time, standing on the dams or with our chiefs in explaining that my children, we don't, you don't have to worry about having more fish back to your place. We are gonna build hatcheries for you. So you will always have fish uh, to fish on. Now, you know, you see those words you know, I lived through that time. I was a young boy, but I remember my grandfathers from Celayo, Yakima, Warmspring, standing on that bridge, listening to the promises of that president and the generals. These are very important words that we hear and that you hear today. Those promises by your forefathers your people, to guarantee us that this fish and these hatcheries were in return to put the fish back in the rivers, not for production, for commercial or, or recreational. Recreational fisheries is where you have a good time going down, going fishing. That doesn't guarantee you a catch rate or something that goes above and beyond what fish is there. We don't have an accurate account of from how much fish is actually caught down there. That's a bad thing. We can only guesstimate and everything. And if you don't want to quit, you're not going to show anything that you've caught. So that's a very, very big concern that my people have. It would be a lot different if the shoe was on the other foot. You guys would be up in arms if the Indians opened the season all year long. No catch reports, no catch impacts. Then how would you feel? So you take notice of what we're saying today is very important for all user groups, not just for treaty fishing, non-treaty fishing above Barnival. It's for all fishermen, ocean, or buoy tin, lower river tributaries, lower river Columbia. You think about that. Take a big step, make a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Questions for Bruce on the uh, tribal report? Okay, seeing no hands. Thank you, Bruce. Um, next up is the uh, Coval Tribal Report and uh, Jared Erickson. Jared? Yeah, can you hear me? We can. 
All right. Good morning. My name is Jared uh, Michael Erickson. I'm a councilman for the Colville Confederated Tribes. I'm also our Natural Resource and Fisheries Chairman. Um, thank you, Council, for allowing me this time to speak. Um, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, or also known as the Colville Tribes, includes 12 tribes and approximately 10,000 enrolled members. We have federally recognized and protected fishing rights to fisheries that are impacted by the management of the, of the Pacific Fishery Marine Council. These rights are protected by federal executive order and statute. They are affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, depending on the fishery. Um, every year, the Colville Tribes receives a, a, a specific allocation of salmon from the fisheries managed by the PFMC, and thus clearly have an acknowledged protectable interest in this process. Uh, in November 2021 and March 2022, the PFMC failed to appoint a Colville Tribes staff member to your Habitat Committee and have not received any correspondence from the PFMC regarding this matter. We have reviewed the Magnuson Stevens Act and the PFMC operating procedures and see nothing that should prevent the Colville Tribes from participating on your advisory board and committees. That there is now a push to deny the Colville Tribes the right to fully participate in the PFMC processes as protected by federal statute and the PFMC operating procedures is disappointing and disheartening. We are aware that this issue will be discussed at the June 2022 meeting and look forward to discussing this matter further. Um, excuse me, sorry. Salmon are extremely important to the, Col the Confederate tribes of the Colville Reservation for its cultural, spiritual needs and subsistence. The, the Colville tribes have participated in many salmon recovery forums and are actively engaged in salmon restoration actions and have commented in a variety of venues about the importance of the fisheries and how salmon occupy a central role, role in the lives of the tribes and tribal members. Hatchery operations from Chief Joseph, Chief Joseph Hatchery produce approximately 3 million Chinook for the system and at, when at full production, and many of these fish are intercepted in the PFMC fisheries each year. The Culver Reservation is located at the terminus of anadromous salmon migration on the Columbia River in north central Washington. Our waters include both healthy runs of summer fall Chinook and sockeye salmon, as well as ESA listed stocks of spring Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. Salmon runs that used to support our subsistence and cultural needs were nearly lost and are currently a fraction of what they were, due in part to the construction and operation of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams. The number of fish available to all groups and individuals who use this resource needs to be increased. One way to do this to increase is the amount of habitat available for spawning by expanding fish distribution to currently blocked areas. In the past, we've presented information about salmon reintroduction to the blocked area upstream of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams to your county. To your council, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel and the Habitat Committee. We appreciated the time the PFC granted to the CTCR to speak with you about your phase one planning work on fish passage in, in 2020 and 2021. We'd like to update the PFMC on the process we have made with our developing an implementation plan for phase two, as well as some exciting results from our cultural releases in the blocked area. We hope that the PFMC can find some time at one of your meetings later this year to hear about our progress on this important project. Summer Chinook and sockeye salmon comprise the majority of our harvest, and in recent years, our harvest has improved from a few hundred fish to a few thousand fish each year for our tribal membership. However, this still does not meet the cultural and subsistent needs of the Colville tribes. We do not have a commercial salmon harvest because of the basic ceremony and subsistent needs for our tribes are not fulfilled by contemporary salmon runs. The lower turns of spring Chinook in 2021 limited the opening of a fishery on our reservation and the forecast for the spring Chinook upstream of Wells Dam in 2022 is not much better. When there's little to no harvest of spring Chinook for the CTCR is critical impairment of our, to our ceremonies and subsistence. The lack of spring Chinook also elevates the importance of summer Chinook to our people. The management alternatives for March 2022 PFMC meetings resulted in a harvest allocation of approximately 3,100 summer Chinook for the Colville tribes. 3,000 fish is not enough to meet the basic ceremonial and subsistent needs of our 10,000 members. Additional, additionally, actual run sizes are often less than preseason forecast, and the fishermen in the river bear all the burden of the restraint when fewer fish show up than anticipated. Therefore, we urge you to adopt Ocean Harvest Alternative 3, thereby taking a risk adverse management strategy. The Colville Tribes wish to thank the other co-managers and the members of the Salmon Advisory Subcommittee for their willing to, willingness to work with the tribes toward a common goal, to, excuse me, towards common goals and taking the tribes' views and concerns in, into consideration. We look forward to the opportunity to continue participating fully in the PFMC processes to protect the tribes' feder federally recognized and protected rights but also to improve stocks for all future users. And again, just thank you all for your time um, and Lim Lim, have a good day. 
Okay. Thank you, Jared. Um, questions for Jared on his uh, tribal report? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. And that concludes our, uh, our reports. Takes us to public comment. I believe we have one comment card in. Okay, I see uh, Barry Day is our public comment. So Barry, are you there? Have you got me there? We do. Okay. Yeah, I'm sitting back this year just um, watching this whole process and I'm a little despondent and thinking what's the point? of having a model um you know first of all we're all fishing i'll fish for fish and use the fishing for data etc there and you know that's a common ground but i'm noticing just the separation there well um susan i'm probably directing towards you there with national marine fisheries where you know, we used to just, oh, gee, that many fish went up the river, okay, that'll be our season. But now it's sort of what's well, National Marine Fisheries going to do. They're going to put a big clamp on it. Where I was hearing the Indians here, and there's some good relevant points there, where the, last year we had a good year, but we worked hard, the commercial sector. We were out on the edge of the shelf and 30, 35 knots, and that's where the fish were. They were just out there. And, you know, we couldn't have predicted that, and we we did well, but I feel we've been punished this year just for that. That's the way I'm feeling it. We're, we're being punished where that, that isn't fair because of the, you know, the, the data didn't compare with uh, what we caught. So... Um, I'm looking at it that way because this year may be different. We may catch nothing and we've got no time on the water. That's pretty much all I've got to say is uh, I'm just noticing some big separation as things go. I, I did read uh, a lot of the comments here and uh, I have no doubt National Marine Fisheries is being uh, influenced by lawyers and publicists, et cetera, there and... Um, we need some help on this. That's where I'm at because it's the water up the rivers. That's the bottom line, and we need more hatcheries. That's pretty much it. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you, Barry. Questions for Barry on his testimony? Okay. Seeing no uh, no hands. Oh, excuse me, Phil Anderson. Just, Mr. Vice Chairman, I just had a question for Dr. O'Farrell at an appropriate time. Please. I, I just wanted to um, ask and or, and or confirm that the modeling results that were presented to us in your supplemental report did include the um, updates that came from the PSC CTC's um, report and the abundance indices and the catch levels for Northern BC and WCVI. Is that correct? Mr. Anderson, that is my understanding. Um, I will note that John Kerry is a panelist here. And I would, if I'm incorrect about that, I would appreciate if John would correct me. <coughs> Huh. Yeah, John. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, that is correct. There, they, those um, numbers are included in the modeling already. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dr. Farrell. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Um, we're past public comment. Before we go to council action, we're take lunch and. Um, a longer lunch because we need to figure out if we can move some stuff up um, to finish this day out. And so with that, we're going to take an hour and a half 
and we'll see you here at 140.
Okay. Welcome back from uh, your lunch. And um, I'd just like to note that we will be going to, um, after this uh, agenda item's over with, we we'll go to uh, G1, City Calibut, to try to uh, take up some additional space here in the time of day and not waste it. So um, with that, we are back on um, D2. We've had uh, our reports, we've had uh, our public comment, and now we go to council action and uh, discussion. And the lack of discussion, a motion. Oops. Chair Grummick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Fenter. I just wanted to thank the SAS. Um, looking at the cal at the at the package that uh, they put forward in their report, it's pretty clear they listened to uh, stakeholders' comments, uh, both uh, those that were provided in the briefing book and those at the hearing. I want to just thank the SAS for that. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Gal Addicts, go. Thank you, Mr. Vice, Vice Chair. I do have a motion, which I believe we should be able to see on the screen. I move to tentatively adopt the ocean salmon fishery management measures for non-Indian fisheries as presented in agenda item T2E supplemental SAS report one dated April 8th, 2022 for STT collation and analysis. Thank you, Kyle. Is the language accurate? It is. Very good. Second. Second by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Kyle, speak, please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, as always, there are a lot of moving pieces as we try to put together the fishery package for the for the entire coast. Um, a lot of work over the past month, a lot of public input, um, new information coming from the north. I believe the package that the SAS has put uh, forward today is a good start for us for a week for this week. There's still pieces to work out with inside fisheries and making sure it all matches up to meet all of our coho and Chinook conservation objectives. But I believe this is a good starting point and want to echo the thanks to the SAS for all their work and say it was good to see you guys all in person this week. Very good. Thank you. Uh, discussion on the motion. Okay. Seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you, Kyle. Um, with that, I'll turn to uh, Joe Obin. Joe, for the tribe. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion. I think uh, Sandra has that, if she can get it put on the screen. Thank you. I move the council adopt for STT analysis the following Trudy Troll salmon management measure. That is 40,000 Chinook and 52,000 Coho. Uh, the alternative consists of a May 1 to June 30 Chinook directed fishery and a July 1 to September 15 all species fishery. The Chinook quota should be evenly split between the two time periods. Thank you, Joe. Is the uh, language on the screen accurate? It is, Mr. Vice Chair. Very good. Second. Second by Kyle Addix. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, please speak to your motion, Joe. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so the uh, tribe's been able to um, put forward uh, this uh, these uh, sets of numbers. Um, it is uh, essentially the um, mid alternative. And the tribes feel that uh, this is a regional step uh, forward, and uh, they look forward to working with the other co-managers to uh, and try to get us there. Thank you, Mr. Vice Very good. Thank you, Joe. Um, discussion on the motion? Okay. Seeing no hands, I'll call for the question. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Um, with that, I'll look to Robin, see how we're doing. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think we've covered a lot of ground under this agenda item. We have a pretty good package for the STT to move forward with for both the uh, non-treaty tribal and the tribal fisheries. So, um, yeah, I think I think you've done your job under this agenda item. I do have one more thing to add, if I may. Please. I wanted to acknowledge that this is the last council hearing of Peggy Mundy in attendance. I know she's retiring and I couldn't let the day go by or this meeting go by without acknowledging how really awesome she is. And I know she's helped me a lot and I don't usually get emotional, but it, it, she's done a lot for me as I've came on new <clears throat> to the council and I just appreciate everything, Peggy. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, well, with that, um, and th thank you for uh, Robin for uh, bringing that up. So, and with that, um, I'm going to hand the gavel back to our chairman. So, Mark. Uh, thank you, Brad, and the council for excellent work on that salmon item. So, uh, as was mentioned, we're we're moving up agenda item G1, Pacific halibut. And um, I'll turn right back to Robin for a uh, situation summary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item G1, the incidental catch limits for the 2022 salmon trail fishery. We'll take final action on that. Uh, under the 2022 Pacific halibut catch sharing plan for the area 2A, there's 15% of the non-Indian commercial halibut allocation given to the salmon trail fishery as incidental catch. The primary management objective outlined in the catch sharing plan is to attain the incidental quota during the April through June portion of the salmon troll fishery and the secondary objective to attain the balance of the incidental quota from July through the end of the salmon troll season. The council has successfully used landing ratios and a total trip limit to ensure that the manageable progression of the fishery occurs as in past years and a summary of the management information for the incidental halibut fishery is provided in attachment one. The current Landing restrictions, which are from April 1 through May 15, are no more than one halibut per each two Chinook, except one halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement, and no more than 35 halibut may be landed per trip. At the March meeting, the Council adopted for public review the following three options for incidental halibut retention in the 2022 salmon troll fishery beginning May 16. Option one, which is status quo, is that license holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. Option two is the same as option one, except for no more than 30 halibut may be landed per trip. And option three is the same as option one, except no more than 25 halibut may be landed per trip. The landing restrictions adopted for the start of the salmon season beginning May 16, 2022 will also be in effect from April 1 through May 15, 2023, unless modified through in-season action or until superseded by the 2022 management measures. I feel like that should say 2023. Yeah, I'll correct that. <laughs> <laughs> so the council action is to adopt final landing restrictions for Pacific halibut caught incidentally in the non-Indian salmon troll fishery from May 16, 2022 through the end of the 22 salmon troll season and prior to the effective date of the 2023 management measures unless modified through in-season action. And for your reference material, you do have the attachment one, which uh, shows you the history of um, how that fishery has been managed. And I also believe we have a supplemental SAS report under this agenda item. And that concludes my summary. All right, thank you very much, Robin. Are there questions of Robin on the overview? Let me check, uh, make sure there's nothing on Ring Central. Um, all right, 
then I guess we'll proceed with the SAS report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ryan Johnson. We'll be reading agenda item G1. <clears throat> Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report on Incidental Halibut Catch Limits in the Troll Fishery. The SAS recommends the following catch limits for final adoption. Option one, open May 16, 2022 through the end of the 2022 Salmon Troll Fishery beginning April 1st, 2023 until modified through in season action or superseded by 23 management measures. License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut for two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut per trip. All right, thank you for that. Are there any questions on the SS report and their recommendation? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the report. Just a question about the beginning date in 2023. You've referenced April 1 um, here as the beginning of the 2023 season. I just want to check that that's the earliest possible opening date for any commercial troll fishery for 2023. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I would have to check the option. It could be March 15th would be a possibility, but I don't know what is in, excuse me, I don't know what's in the Oregon option. So I'd ask for help. Robin, you have some clarification? It's my understanding that um, IPHC um, allows halibut retention beginning April 1. And so that's the reason for the April 1 date. All right. Thank you. Further questions of the SAS on the report? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I know that we had, uh, that, uh, that's the only report we have, I believe, Robin. And um, we had one uh, public comment uh, submitted with a briefing book, which is available. And I don't see any signups for public comment here. So that will take us to council discussion and action. And our action here is to, it's up on the screen there to, it's our final action here. So let me look to see if there's any discussion um from the council on this and then after we've had an opportunity for discussion if any then i'll look to see if someone wants to offer a motion phil anderson thanks mr chair i would i would just um note that this the recommendation obviously from the sas is for status quo <clears throat> last year the the troll uh incidental catch a halibut fell considerably below uh, their allowed uh, allowable number. Um, we had some, at least for the troll fishery off of Washington, where we typically have a lot of our May salmon fishery and the troll fishery occur up in the area we call the prairie up off the push in Nia Bay, where there's more halibut uh, than there is to the south. Uh, and last year, the salmon were not present up in that area. So the majority of the effort in the spring was further to the south where the incidental um, catch of halibut is less. So I think this this makes what the SAS is, is proposed makes sense to me and um, I'd be supportive of it when the motion comes forward. Thanks. Thank you. Any further discussion? Heather? Thank you, Chair Groundlick. Um, just agree with um, what um, Mr. Anderson just said, and I do have a motion uh, ready for that if there's no other discussion. I, I believe we're ready because there's always an opportunity for discussion during the motion. Okay, thank you. And I did send that to Sandra and Chris, but I'm not sure if they have it quite yet. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I move that the council adopt the option one catch limit for the 2022 salmon fishery as described in the supplemental salmon advisory sub panel report and our agenda item G1A, April 2022. Option one is open May 16th, 2022 through the end of 2020, the 2022 salmon troll fishery and beginning April 1, 2023 until modified through in-season action or superseded by the 2023 management measures. License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. Thank you, Heather, for the motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. I'll look for a second, seconded by Butch Smith. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. I think uh, this sets a good starting point for the salmon troll fishery um, and incidental limits that are in line uh, with what were in place last year. And, and uh, that's it. All right. Any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? All right. I'm not seeing any hands. Doesn't mean someone's not raising their hand. I certainly don't see it. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Heather, thank you for the motion. Uh, before I turn back to Robin, is there anything else from the council on this agenda item? Robin, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you've completed uh, your work underneath this agenda item. I'll include the um, final uh, action here in the uh, upcoming salmon packages that come your way. It'll have reflect that as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Robin. So that um, concludes what we're gonna get done for today uh, in the council session. <clears throat> That'll get everyone a chance to go back to the room and get gussied up for the chairman's reception uh, tonight at six o'clock. It maxes on the top floor. Um, I'll see if executive director Merrick Burden has any announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do not have any announcements. That was my remaining note was of the chairman's reception. So uh, thank you for stealing my thunder. <laughs> Otherwise, um, very nice job today, everyone. And uh, we are quite ahead of schedule. So good job. Thank <laughs> you.